I'm very glad to introduce our eminent and distinguished speaker for today's uh, session, Professor B. Subramaniam. Professor Subramaniam is currently associated in the capacity of a professor with the Department of Physics at IIT Madras. He has completed his Master's of Science in Physics from the American College Madurai and PhD from IIT Madras in 1995. After a brief stint as lecturer in Bits Pilani, Professor Subramaniam joined IIT Madras in 1998. His research interests include relaxer ferroelectrics, dielectrics, multiferroics, magnetoelectric dielectric materials, microwave band gap structures and metamaterial, scanning near field microwave microscopy, microwave passive and illuminated imaging, electromagnetic shielding effectiveness, magneto impedance studies at micro frequencies, and black body radiator for micro application. Professor Subramaniam has published more than 100 journals in revered publications, over 100 papers in renowned national and international conferences, and also has one patent. He has also supervised over 18 doctoral students, apart from several uh, master students. He has completed over uh, 20 sponsored projects and, uh, sanctioned by DST, DRDO, IPR, Ahmedabad, and many other uh, such renowned <coughs> associations. Professor Subramaniam is a senior IEEE member, life member of IAPT, and fellow of the Academic of Sciences, Chennai. With this brief introduction, I heartily welcome Professor B. Subramaniam on behalf of Esron family to present his eagerly awaited enchanting talk. Welcome, sir. And thank you, Professor Anirban, for a nice introduction. Thank you, Dr. Divya. Thank you, Gautam. Let me present uh, the screen. Yeah, so Subramaniam sir yeah. has been research in many ways. He, he has been an uh, external DC member of mine as well as for my student. So I have been uh, like with Subramaniam sir since a long time. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh, Professor Divya pointed out, you know, I know her right from her PhD days. Okay. She was with NIT Tiruchi and I used, uh, used to go there for uh, most of the day. Her uh, colleagues were DC meetings also. And then I had met her. Uh, okay. Professor, I think you did under Professor Raghavan. Uh, uh, yes. He's also uh, a very eminent person in the field of uh, microwaves. So this is, uh, okay. So let me thank uh, the SRM AP administration as well as uh, HOD, Dr. Gautam and Dr. Divya for inviting me to be here. So today I would be talking something about the metamaterials, which many of the people are familiar with now, because this field is uh, going on for the last uh, 20 years uh, maximum. So right from 1990, after 1990s onwards, this uh, uh, field has gained the momentum. So let us see what uh, we have also done in this particular area. Metamaterials means uh, beyond, okay, meta means beyond. So beyond materials, a normal material. It's not a normal material, it's a different kind of a material. Okay. So, So any uh, natural material okay, it will have a certain property and it is homogeneous, but uh, the same property you cannot expect uh, when you do some drastic changes in that. Like, you know, you drill a hole, okay, you make it anisotropic, or you, when by drilling hole, you will also make it in homogeneity, or by adding something other materials inside that itself. So by changing many things, many the structural variations in that, you will be able to modify the parameters. Okay, so, uh, the parameters becomes a now a tensor property. So once there's a tensor property, then depending on the direction, directionality, you will be able to achieve the material property. In the case of the electromagnetic materials, uh, all the total propagation is actually controlled by the dielectric and magnetic uh, properties. In the case of the optics, we don't worry about the magnetic part really because it does not, uh, or it does, uh, that not, does not give any response to that. So in the case of the uh, dielectric uh, thing, okay, they will be having either a positive, very near to zero or negative. But in the case of the microwave region, we have the both uh, dielectric as well as magnetic part playing a very important role. 
So if I have this particular uh, graph, you all will be, will be familiar with this. Okay? You will have the positive or normal material, which is in the first quadrant, and uh, where the epsilon and mu both will be positive. Here, in this particular graph, uh, the graphical representation, uh, every time you will be having only the real part of the dielectric permittivity as well as the permeability is uh, noted. Okay. So here you will get this uh, epsilon mu both to be positive and then epsilon to be negative. And then here both will be negative and here only the permeability will become negative. So whenever you are having this normal material, you know very well that uh, it becomes a normal propagation. And then when it becomes uh, these two second and fourth quadrant, there won't be any wave propagation in that. We are answering this. Uh, so when there is no wave propagation, we'll have everything gets reflected. And in case of the third uh, thing, you will have a propagation, but it will have a left-handed nature. So this type of uh, materials, uh, they turned to be a metamaterial. Okay? And before the co coining the word metamaterial, there were something uh, photonic crystals, which were doing this particular job. So the metamaterials, we have several categories nowadays. Uh, one is the electromagnetic metamaterials, then acoustic metamaterials. We have mechanical metamaterials also. So depending on how the viscosity and then wave propagation happens in the for the acoustic medium, acoustic medium, we have acoustic metamaterials. Most of the properties, what all war, most of the uh, work what we are doing in the electromagnetic region can also be done in the acoustic region. Please note that these two will be having a common thing that the dispersion is always linear in nature. But in the case of mechanical materials, mostly they deal with the vibration aspects of that. So as usual, now being electrical engineers, uh, you are all electrical engineers. So we'll be having this uh, electromagnetic materials we'll deal with. So, uh, so this materials can be broadly classified as left-handed, can be zero index material, can have single negative materials okay then you can have a random arrangement it can be neither periodic nor random it can be based on the geometric nature or geometric optics base or conformal mapping based or transformation optic base etc so these things come under the category of the homogeneous materials so you have broadly homogeneous random inhomogeneous materials so all these things you know they are uh, you can now it's a very broad term okay so whether it is going to be a photonic crystal or it is going to be a, a planar materials, okay, or you can say low profile, you can say stop planar, we use low profile materials, okay. All these things come under the category of the materials, okay. So even with this particular case where we have a laughing mirror, this also comes under the beta material, but you no, know, we always deal with the transformation optics approach in this. Okay, so in 1965, Veselago actually conceptualized and then now developed practically by Bindri in 1996. So most of these metamaterials, they are artificial structures. They, are, they have to be periodic in nature, but then the periodicity, okay, how much it has to be periodic, how it can be changed, all these things will depend on the uh, application point of view. Then it must be sub-wavelength in dimension, but this is not, may not critically uh, analyzed, okay. Uh, when you say subwavelength dimension, I generally say that it will be along the direction of propagation and include the metal layers to manipulate the radiation. So these th characteristics, no, they generally used for metamaterials. But nowadays, no, everything is, can be changed. Even now we have the metal-free structures, which are also called metamaterials. There are certain topological invariants, which are also called metamaterials. So, okay, so. Uh, if you see that uh, uh, general thing is that anything exhibiting uh, anything, any properties exhibited beyond the normal region, we can say that as a metamaterial. So you can see that photonic crystals can be there, many resonances can be there, topological variants can be there, metal free structures can be there. All these things also come under the category of the metamaterials. So let me see something about the photonic crystal first. Okay. So this photonic crystal, you know very well that you know they are all under periodic structures. And people nowadays, they are not talking about the photonic crystals mainly because they moved away from the motor photonic crystal. But all these topological properties and other things, they are very well to be established through this uh, photonic crystals only. Therefore, one should not leave away this. Therefore, I'm giving this uh, presentation. So these photonic crystals, uh, no, they, they are none other than the periodic impedance structures. Okay, Even in the nature, we are having such a periodic nature uh, uh, photonic crystals. Uh, which can be, you can even see 
you know, in the normal life, okay, like butterfly uh, wings, etc. So what is that you are getting here? You are getting <coughs> multiple reflections <coughs> within the structure. And then you can see, depending on the uh, periodicity, you will be able to see several bands. Okay, And the, for the band here means uh, that uh, there are certain frequencies which will not be allowed to pass through. That means they will get affected. So in case I'm having a structure, having a periodicity of the order of lambda, if the lambda falls in the optical region, I will be able to get a reflection which I will be able to see with my naked eye. In the case of the microwave, okay, we cannot see with the naked eye, but we may have to send the radiation and then get the reflection and then study with the sensors. Okay, so when you analyze these things, okay, it is uh, uh, you have to you, you have to see the uh, uh, analogous to that. So the analogous, if you see that, it will be a crystal lattice. So in the crystal lattice, we have a concept of the band gap. That band gap, if you see that the, the electrons flow through the crystal lattice and they get reflected due to the uh, potential difference. Okay, so this potential difference will be able to reflect to the electrons, okay, and then also accelerate it. Because of that, you get a kind of a periodic potential. So this periodic potential will try to uh, manipulate the electron flow and you get that kind of a band gap. So in this particular case, we have impedance structures. Okay, which are varying with space. So it is similar, similar to that of the atomic uh, uh, crystal lattice. And therefore, you will have the, such a uh, arrangement which would be able to reflect the photons. And then this multiple reflections will be able to give you the photonic uh, bands. Okay. So um, you can see that uh, this was first developed by in Eli Ablonovich in 1987. Okay. He wanted to show that uh, this can actually be the spontaneous emission. So for that purpose, the year was started, but then you, know, you have got any such variations in that. So in case you just take a case of multiple reflections, a simple uh, uh, evaluation uh, of the electric field uh, before the interface and then after the, uh, after the interfaces can be used to have a kind of a uh, multiple uh, uh, structures to be put. So you will be able to get to the electric field variations, okay? As a function, and, and, uh, with all the layers in that, you can put the n is the number of the nth layer. Mm. Okay? So you will be able to get the electric field, which is on propagating in the positive direction as well as in the negative direction. And then you will be able to get the reflection coefficient as well as the transmission coefficient. So if you use this particular configuration, you will be able to see a kind of a transmission as well as a reflection. You have seen about the nanocrystals in the uh, solid state physics, where you say that nanocrystals will not follow the uh, exact band diagram as that of the perfect crystal, which will be having several lattices in that. So mainly because here you see that when I'm increasing the number of sets, that means the number of crystals, I will be able to see a kind of a sharp bands. So this is uh, now, you, the, unlike that of the uh, crystal lattice, you will not be, uh, you will be here getting uh, many such uh, bands, whereas in the case of the crystal lattice, you will not be getting many such bands. Okay, so another approach is to analyze it through the uh, uh, band structure. So this band structure calculations can be done using a plane wave uh, methodology. Okay, so you take many plane waves and then pass it through the crystal. You will be able to see the allowed solutions for that. Okay, so where the solutions are forbidden, uh, you will not be able to get the values for omega. Where it is allowed, you will be getting the values for the omega. So by the, putting this block periodic boundary condition, Okay, you will be able to analyze this particular periodic uh, uh, crystal lattice. Here it is going to be photonic crystal lattice. Okay, you will be able to, depending on the structure, you will be able to draw this particular band diagram. So what is this band diagram will tell us? The band diagrams will give us a kind of an isofrequency contours or agent frequency contours or equifrequency contours. Many times we use uh, EFCs, etc. Some people will be using IFC. Okay. So all these things will tell you about the frequency. So you take any frequency, all this is actually given in terms of the normalized frequencies. And K here is going to be the input value of the uh, uh, wave vector in terms of the uh, A by 2 pi. So whenever you are having this uh, line soon, we'll have it first of the lines will have plus or minus pi by A. So like that, no, you will be able to see that. Gamma, X, M, they are all related to the symmetry points in the crystal lattice. So here, the same symmetry lattice is used for the photonic crystal also. So it is going to have a gamma for this highest symmetry point. X is going to be along the direction of along x-axis, 
and m is for the 45 degrees to that for the square lattice. So, uh, in case you are having such a, a, a lattice formed using a glass, you will be able to see a kind of a, a forbidden region in this, okay, which you, uh, you can see from the transmission curve from that. Then this forbidden region, you will not have any way to be propagating through that, mainly because there is going to be a destructive interference, okay, and there will be everything getting reflected back. So, in case we are having some defects in that by removing any material like that of the crystal lattice, where by removing or by having any defects in the crystal lattice, you would be having certain allowed modes to be there within the forbidden band. So, here also you will be having a allowed mode in the forbidden band. So, this is given by a very sharp rise in that. So, this is an theoretical one, this is an experimentally observed one, where you can see that you know, in case you are having this. Uh, as a triangular lattice, by removing one particular uh, lattice point, you create a defect. By creating the defect, you will be able to trap the energy levels between that. So, depending on the frequency of uh, input, you will be able to see either low, I means a lower order mode or higher order modes. Okay, so you will be here, you will find that the modes are happening in the uh, uh, air, means the vacuum region, you can say, or air region, or the background region, you can say that. The case of the uh, uh, one full layer to be removed, I will be able to get a kind of a fabric pro etalon. So this fabric pro etalon will be able to pass, uh, it will be able to actually couple the power to the next one. If at all, that's going to be a transmission, otherwise it will be able to store the uh, uh, power in that. Okay. So uh, depending on the uh, defect nature here, defect width, you will be able to choose the frequency of operation. So this way, you know, one will be able to choose very nice, you know, like a kind of a single frequency operation or monochromatic operation. Okay. So now we we'll go back to the uh, band structure uh, diagram, band structure diagram here. So from this band structure diagram, what is it we understand? We understand that if we are able to have such a kind of variation, I will be able to get a very normal operation in this region. I can get a, a very slow speed here in this particular region. And then here I may get even negative refraction. So you will be able to see that I can, I will be able to realize the negative refraction. I will be able to realize the focusing effect. I will be able to realize the near field imaging. And then I will be able to steer the beam depending on the direction of propagation. So the, all these things are mainly due to the anisotropic nature of the medium. So whenever you are putting this photonic crystal, as I mentioned earlier, in your homogeneous medium, you may have, have certain properties. So in case all these uh, rods are, here it is a two-dimensional thing, so I take it as a rod. So all these rods are combined together and make it as a block. You may not have this property, but as soon as you start removing the material from a, such a way that to create a set of a rods in that, you will be able to get it a kind of a uh, band structure and depending on the frequency of operation or what the frequency you are giving and the direction in which it is the wave vector is falling into that, you will be able to realize uh, the uh, variation in that. So the anisotropic nature of the medium comes into picture. In that. Okay. So let us uh, write, uh, the, get to this EFCs or isofrequency contours or aging frequency contours. And from this particular agent frequency contour, realized from the top of the band structure, because band structure is a 2D one, where now you have only gamma, X, M, et cetera. But as soon as, you know, it has a symmetry in the X and Y direction, you would have a 360 degree operation, you will be able to see a kind of a circle. In case you are in the linear uh, thing region, you make a circle here, you will be able to get the contours. Okay? So these contours are called the equi frequency contours or agent frequency contours or ISO frequency contours. So they represent the energy of that. So in, as soon as you have this uh, as the, now what is that radius gives you? The radius means it is actually the, uh, from the center you start moving away, huh? the radial direction, huh? you will find that, uh, that it gives the values of the wave vector. Okay. So as the wave vector increases, you will find that the radius increases. But then what are the allowed values, not the allowed values, all these things will be represented by these values written here. Okay, so this is how now you describe the seek frequency contour. So this is for the band one, if it were, you are having, for the band two, that means the second Brillouin zone, you will be equal and you can say Brillouin zone, may say Brillouin zone generally is used for the physics concept where the crystal lattice. I am going to use the same thing here, 
okay so in this particular secondary line zone you will be able to see a kind of a reverse trend here okay here as k is increasing omega is also increasing whereas as k is increasing omega is decreasing so here you will find that it is decreasing so where where you can see you can relate to this to the previous one in this diagram here so this is the second band which is going like this okay so you will be able to have a variation so from this no you will be able to see many things like no it can have a refraction a negative refraction it can have self collimation okay then it can, it can have a left handed efc in this particular region all these things are possible to realize from a normal material just by uh, arranging it in order okay you will be able to, or by removing the materials from the block okay, you will be able to get achieved this okay so so you take uh, sorry, a equal frequency chord from the circle any incident radiation on this you will get to the emerging one which is from the normal outward normal to that therefore you will be able to have a for a circular isotropic nature there is no variation at all so if you put switch on the torch it simply propagates okay along the same direction it does not deviate from that but in the case of the anisotropic okay depending on the direction it will change in case i put it in this direction my ray gets the refracted okay so that is going to be a refraction in there so in the case of the negative refraction you see that when it falls on this it is a outward normal okay supposed to be here but the power will go through this therefore you can say it is represented to be a negative refraction in this and in case you are you are weak frequency contour is a flat one you will be able to have for any direction of incident you will be able to get always the collimated beam so you will be able to get many conditions like you no know, positive refraction negative refraction positive phase negative phase etc depending on how it is so no no you can ask where can i use the same thing for the homogeneous material also same concept can be used for homogeneous material because when i say this is an incident it depends on from which region it is incident on there it can be either within the photonic crystal or it can be from the outside of the photonic crystal there so the outside medium can be air okay or inside medium if we take it inside itself we take as photonic crystals are block there it's a lot so you can take it okay so when as i mentioned as the radius represents the uh, refractive index here okay so you can say k that's a k vector uh, values okay it will be representing so in case i have this uh, uh, refractive index to be n1 for a, then the other medium is going to be n2 and the radiation the ray starts from n1 to n2 and f2 is greater than n1 then you will be able to draw this isofrequency contour like this and depending on the direction of propagating this is the direction i am pro propagating so you pro put it in a direction put a normal and go to the next one and see the output now you combine these two you will be able to see the refraction in that so this is how now you define how the ray gets bent okay so now can i use this to the uh, wave ray diagram for that yes now you what you do you get to the uh, band structure then get to your equal frequency contours choose the region okay and then the freak the wave k vector as well as the direction that means norm uh, magnitude as well as the direction you have to choose and then plot the uh, equal frequency contour from the for the source medium source region so source me region can be air and if and then you want to make it fall on the photonic crystal so that you choose and then draw the diagram okay so with that you will be able to find out whether there is going to be next allowed modes to be there within the uh uh photonic crystal or not similarly if you are inside the photonic crystal you can put that as a source point and then you can take whether the uh, radiation can come out or not so all these things can be done there so you will have a normal region you can have anomalous region. so that is the reason whenever you are having this uh, uh, near the brillouin zone edge you will have enormously uh, different property that's why the anomalous and people will also say that it's a slow light okay light gets slowed down okay so that tree all phenomena can also be seen in this simple photonic crystal okay so you can see the, the negative region here okay then you are also having as i mentioned the second band i have already uh, explained about this anomalous regions be like okay so so how do i use this uh, to get the uh, uh, focusing point so in order to have a focusing so it is not simply enough to arrange everything there i have as i mentioned i have to see the weak frequency contours etc in case this is my region of the, the air weak frequency contour point for the normalized frequency of 0.319 and then this is the frequency contour for the uh, 
TM mode or TE mode here both are almost same. Okay, on the part for the photonic itself, then the incident ray falls from the uh, thing to the air medium. It follows, you know, for an example, both are coinciding here, so it falls on that. There will be a, a negative component to this, and therefore a positive component will come along this direction because for the continuity sake. So the output will be along this direction, having a negative phase. In it. That means you will have a negative refraction. So you will be if you take if you collect all the other angles you will be able to see a kind of a focusing region of that okay so similarly if you are taking this uh, line light okay and then start putting it in terms of the uh, 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 photonic crystal as well as the part of the uh, that of the air medium you will be able to see certain regions which are can be extended certain regions can be decaying regions okay so the I mean, extended means it will be allowed and it's not allowed so choose the regions and then start putting the uh, material in a proper geometric uh, nature. So, okay. So, as soon as we start putting that, okay, you, in this particular case, for 0.4836, uh, uh, normalized frequency, you will be able to see that uh, the ray will not come out of this. I mean, this is a simple slab I have taken. In the simple slab, I put a source, and the source radiation will not come out. Okay, they will be staying within that. Okay, so once it stays within that, okay. It, that why it should stay within that because it is not allowing to come out. Okay, so the whole region will be uh, staying within that. So if I start giving the uh, uh, excitation at around fourteen point five, okay, you can see that you will be able to get a very sharp increase in the frequency, not electric field. So intensity will be enormous. Okay, within that, that's how things it will give away. So except that everything will be there. So this radiation will be with you staying within that. So this is something like a fabric pyrotalon. Where the fabric pyrotalon, what you have done, you have taken a kind of a two different uh, or two mirrors, and then the radiation will be staying within that. In this particular case, the whole mirror, what is the region within that itself, is a photonic crystal. Okay, so that itself can be acting like that. So with this, uh, what is that we can gain? We can gain is a kind of a. a, a a fabric pro this is called a kind of a fabric pro resonance okay which you will be able to uh, uh, change with respect to the spacings of that so when i little bit bend okay so if i bend this particular uh, photonic crystal okay very small bend is sufficient enough what happens the spacing is changing because of the change in the spacing the ff the fabric pro resonance also will shift so this fabric pro resonance shift will be able to uh, give a kind of a um, uh, uh, indication about how much it is bend, uh, means bending. That means this can be if I take a photonic crystal and then paste it on that wall, and then I can see the uh, glowing of that. I mean, because the source is also there, it will not allow. So, if I'm able to see the uh, 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 you don't need to even attach any uh, uh, contact contacts to that, we'll be able to see a kind of a, a strain induced on that. Okay. So here, if you see that it is a 1.7 milli radians, if that's a shift, okay. This is approximately around, I think, 9, uh, 90 milli, I think, in milli degrees, I think so, okay. So it is around 1.7 milli radians, if there's a variation, I will be able to have a shift of around 20 megahertz. So one will be able to use it for the sensor purposes. Okay, so, so this uh, bending of light can also be used, okay to have a kind of a, uh, a negative refraction, as I mentioned. So choose the negative refraction region. By choosing the negative refraction region, even if you are putting this plane wave, you will be able to put a kind of a variations like this and then come out. So it is different from that of the norm. So if at all I'm getting it, what else I can achieve? So I will be able to achieve a kind of a focusing. So this can be used to have a focusing in that. So near field focusing can also be used in this. Once you have the self collimation property, I can even use it like a kind of a prism. I can nicely uh, turn it around and do it. So with this now, I will be able to get a kind of a uh, uh, clocking device. Okay, uh, this clocking device can be used to, by taking the uh, pyramidal structures. Okay, uh, it has prism type of structures here in two dimension. So these things can be used to actually bend the radiation without any loss and then recombine that. Only thing is that you no, know, you will be able to with uh, uh, that you no, know, in case of these structures are not there, the phase difference will happen. No doubt about that. So that uh, forgetting about the phase difference, okay, by putting it, you will be able to see a kind of a electric field that is comes out of the uh, region. Okay, you will be able to see that both are going to be the same. 
whether it is uh, having a with the uh, metal inside or without metal, you will be able to get the kind of a, a same wheel chains in that. Okay, so the other methodology is that uh, by varying the uh, 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 refractive index. Okay, this refractive index or the dielectric constant that you can vary by uh, varying the uh, dimensions of that. So even though all these uh, the, the, the earlier slides you have seen that uh, the photonic crystal having the same uh, dimension of the materials used, one by varying the dimensions, one will be able to get a different uh, effective uh, dielectric uh, values. Okay. So in color, in other words, we can get a different refractive index. So this is coming under the category of uh, uh, um, gradient index materials. Okay, say they simply will say that green materials. Okay, so this uh, spatial variations. Okay, uh, will be able to actually uh, control the nature of propagation. One can use it for focusing effect. Okay, this is what we are doing it even uh, for the acoustic medium. So we are trying to change the uh, refractive index here for the optical region. For acoustic, we change the uh, the equivalent refractive index. Okay, so that now we'll be able to focus the acoustic uh, the radiation what we are getting at a single point. So here also what we do is in case we take a, a medium which is having a variation of the refractive index along the radial direction, you will be able to focus that or you will be able to manipulate the dimension of that. So here we say that spatial compression also can be done. So spatial is called spatial beam compression. Like what we do you know, in optics uh, using uh, uh, two slits uh, and, then, uh, and slits with uh, two, uh, um, uh, uh, okay, the lenses, okay, here also we'll be able to do that. So what we have used is the simple uh, uh, formation like you know, N naught into 1 minus alpha squared by 2 into R squared, you will be able to uh, vary the dimension of that and then right, uh, get to the equivalent refractive index. Okay? So the equivalent refractiveness, as soon as you get it, you can arrange it in this particular fashion. So at the center, you see that you will have a higher refractive index. As you go on to the outer region, you will have a lower refractive index. So with that, you ha can have a broader uh, power if you are given that a uh, wave is there. It will be able to get shrink, and then you will be able to get a very smaller region here. That means you will be able to compress the beam. So with this no compression, you can actually take the regular beam and then reduce the beam diameter and then without any loss and then send it to the device of your interest. Okay, so this beam compression is possible only by uh, varying a simple gradient index. So, this is also another application of this photonic. Here you can see that, um, uh, what about the periodicity? Okay, so is it now periodic along, along this particular direction? No, along the radial direction, it is not having periodicity, no doubt about that, but still, we say that it's going to be giving a kind of a, a photonic crystal concept in that. So, uh, depending on, uh, uh, there may be some errors in, uh, within that, okay, because as per the definition, we say that photonic crystal should have a periodicity, okay, a large amount of periodicity, okay. But still, here if we see that uh, the periodicity is missing along the radial direction, but there's a periodicity available along the uh, 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 propagation direction, but still here you see that there's going to be change, okay. So, um, it all depends on the applications what you are using. But then uh, people started asking that uh, why do we have to use uh, huge structures? Because photonic crystals are huge structures. Can we change that? Okay. And another thing is that can we also use the magnetic materials for that? Okay. So it is also possible to use magnetic uh, materials uh, as a kind of a photonic crystals. But people did not worry about that mainly because uh, the whole work. You know, they were all uh, biased towards the optical region and therefore they did not, they were only worried about refractive index which actually points towards the dielectric constant rather than the magnetic part. Another important thing is that you know, the magnetic parts are all, uh, magnetic uh, materials are all lossy materials inherently. Only very few materials you, know, you can find that uh, very having a, uh, an equivalent kind of insulator nature in the thing like you know, so if you take the case of nickel ferrite, it is a conducting nature. Okay. So you, very, very few materials will have a uh, insulating nature. In, even though you say the insulator, it doesn't mean that uh, it will have a very high resistivity, but it will have a resistivity of the order of uh, ohms to kilo ohms. Okay, so for microwave purposes, it is uh, still lossy. Okay, that's the reason people did not choose that. But anyhow, uh, when we were using this uh, magnetic, magnetic photonic crystals, okay, 
we could see that you know, there is going to be a slight change in the band gap values. So the band gaps are formed in the magnetic uh, photonic crystal is uh, lower than that of that equivalent of pure dielectric material. Okay. The main reason is that uh, new you no know, impedance is going to be square root of new epsilon, whereas the refractive index is new is going to be uh, square root of new epsilon. Okay, so still it is possible, but because of the loss in nature, we cannot uh, make a, a big race, etc., because uh, the values of uh, the electric field will come down very quickly. Then, uh, is it possible to have a kind, just a kind of a magnetic part somewhere in the uh, uh, in a different way? Yes, it is possible by using metallic things. Okay, so if I am able to combine this electric and magnetic plasma structure, we can give rise to manipulation of the refractive index. Okay. So uh, this is uh, was you know concepted uh, once again as I mentioned earlier, uh, they experimented by uh, Penry in 1990. Okay. So let us take this case of the plasma. Plasma, you know very well that it can be none other than the uh, free oscillations of the charges, okay, electrons here. In case we are taking the electrons, the absence of the electron is going to be pole, and therefore we can say they will be following a kind of a dipole. So when these type of dipoles are there, they have resonance, they will also have a damping. So using the two concepts, you will be able to get the uh, refract, your, your uh, uh, electric constant or refract index, okay, in terms of the polarization, okay, so as you know very well that uh, small p is a dipole moment, m is going to be the mass of the electron, okay, and then lambda is going to be the damping frequency if you want to take it, and omega naught is the resonance frequency involved in that. You will be able to see that the polarization p is going to be minus m p vector. Okay, so here you will find that uh, p vector is going to be written in terms of the n q square e by m into omega naught square minus omega square plus omega lambda omega. So from there you will be able to get your epsilon r prime and then epsilon r double prime. So here omega p is going to be the plasma frequency. Okay. Um, so when I when I am going to plot it, the plot will be showing one like this. In the actual material, you will not be having a single relaxation part. Okay, uh, materials will be having multiple resonances and multiple damping parts. Okay, so uh, you may have to add such a things to be together, and then you will be able to get then a, a net value of your dielectric constant as well as the loss net. Okay, so here you see that very near to the resonance, you will be finding the negative value of the dielectric constant. Okay. So once you are having, and then in case now you are going getting this dielectric plasma, in case we are going to get the magnetic plasma, which also have the negative values very close to that, the, the, to that of the same frequency as that of the earlier one, we will be able to achieve a kind of a negative refractive index. That means negative value of the dielectric constant and negative value of the magnetic permeability. That means this will become a double negative material. So in this particular magnetic plasma, what you have to do is you have to make a metal and then make the metal in terms of a loop. Once you are putting a loop to that and then apply magnetic field to that, you will be able to see a kind of an induced EMF. From the induced EMF, you will be able to evaluate the effective value of the uh, permeability. So magnetic permeability, you can write in terms of this L and the C. So by writing this uh, omega naught squared in terms of one by root L, C, and then omega in terms of one by root LC and damping frequency lambda as R by L, you will be able to get an equivalent value of a mu R prime and mu R double prime. Okay. So once you are having this uh, uh, two magnetic plasma as well as the uh, uh, electric plasma, you will be able to design the metamaterial devices. So now the, all these uh, their work, you know, they started because it is now becoming a planar, okay, then uh, uh, they started uh, calling this a different name. Metamaterials. Okay, so this uh, uh, metamaterials. Uh, the, the the thing is that uh, these uh, uh, inductances as well as the capacitances, equivalent values of that. Okay, you will be able to realize in a miniaturized way. That means the dimension becomes much much lower than that of the lambda. So that is another biggest advantage of that. So you have uh, something called a split ring resonators, and you have something called metallic wires. And with these two, you will be able to manipulate the values of the epsilon and mu. Okay, so any structure you take it, okay, it will have a component of a loop plus the straight lines. Okay, so straight wires will be there and loops will be there. So you will be able to check whether it is more of the electric response or it can have both there. Okay, these two, this is a kind of only electric response. 
this can have both the things okay so like that no you will be able to get a kind of a variations in that so like that of you know we use rangoli okay i will so this can you do also do use the kind of rangoli to get such a uh, combinations in that but basically one we should be able to see whether it is going to have a an equivalent value of inductance and capacitance most of the times so for complicated structures it is very difficult to evaluate so for that you may have to use the full wave simulators so you can have in case you are going to define design this uh, antenna for that you have to check whether it has to be band pass or band projector okay or filters again okay, it is going to be absorber then you have to check uh, antenna you have to check whether for the beam from uh, how the beam should be okay then whether the polarization conversion you are going to use it or you want to have the improved antenna performance or for all these things depending on the applications will be able to choose the structures to do that okay so we will be able to get an equivalent value of celsius so it can be series celsius or parallel celsius or many celsius there okay as i mentioned it did not have a single celsius it can have multiple values to do that okay so if at all we are going to use it for the patch antenna yes you may have to look into the kinds of the bandwidth okay directivity okay sometimes you may not need the directivity because you want to use it only for the receiving purposes sometimes you may have to use it for imaging purpose that time you may need a very narrow band okay very narrow beam width okay like that no many things will be there okay so these metamaterials they started having enormous application in case of the shielding absorbers polishing converters blocking perfect lens sensors antennas harvesting things and computers okay so other important thing is getting the zero index material so why zero index material is important because zero index material will not have any dispersion so whenever you are going to use an antenna okay this antenna so the radiation pattern you can actually manipulate by using the zero index material so this zero index material you will be able to control the phase of that okay so by controlling the phase you will be able to get a sharper beam in that okay. not only really that sometimes you may have to use the zero index material to convert from one mode to another mode okay so it has lot of applications in that so this is one of one such uh, uh, zero index material that we developed okay which is operating at around 6.05 you will find that you know uh, for a uh, near zero index material the variation is very even though i say zero index it's very difficult to get the exactly zero so i will say that is going to be near zero index material so near values you no know, you will be able to see that so for a, you see the variation without anything you can see that uh, the the electric field varies quickly as soon as whereas in the zero index material so or you can say n is at i m you can see that it very slowly it is very so one will be able to see a kind develop a kind of uh, these structures or they that can be used to, to manipulate the uh, uh, the beam propagation okay so uh, another so these uh, type of things also will be incorporated in this okay this type of uh, evolved antennas okay you can find the slots in that these slots will have a kind of a zero index nature okay so this will be able to create a kind of a narrow beam okay beam variations between that so any period this periodic structures if you see that these uh, small gaps they will create a kind of a phase jump in that because of this phase jumps you will be able to see a kind of a uh, uh, Ma the variations in the uh, beam coming out okay and they will interact with the neighboring ones and do that so one will be able to manipulate the dimensions and then arrange it in the different order okay so even though we have a sheet like this this sheet may have a different different uh, uh, the structures okay so you can say geometrically same structure but uh, but the space uh, the exact uh, dimension wise it will be different so by making that you will be able to actually control the beam variations okay so one will be able to take it from the uh, broad we were if you take a broad we were that i will be able to manipulate the whole variations within that so these type of uh, uh, tasser faces are being developed okay to manipulate the beam uh, bit what we have done is we have taken this super stretch to uh, reduce the beam uh, uh, beam bit okay by taking uh, two super stretch no arranged in order okay from the simple patch antenna we could actually reduce the um, beam width okay enormously okay you can find that you know its directivity also has improved enormously uh, to that of 20 db okay whereas uh, earlier it was very almost around 60 db okay so these uh, meta surfaces can be uh, they are none other than the materials okay they will be able to actually 
um, uh, manipulate the beam uh, with torque. So one will, as I mentioned that, uh, even though you are using the split rings, you can make two different split rings and arrange in a different way, okay? And put a source in between. And then depending on the frequency region, you will be able to act like a kind of a switch here. So for certain frequencies, you will be able to have two beams coming out. For other frequencies, it will come in the other two directions. So you have to draw the uh, band structure diagrams and then check on what frequency this is going to travel. So another important thing is that you, uh, in the other methodologies, we use a full wave simulator and get for each and every individual uh, uh, split ring resonator combinations, check what are the allowed values and then decide and then uh, make it such a way that you are having distinct frequencies, okay. For certain frequency, this will be operating, but for other frequency, this will be operating. So it should forbid the frequency what we are, this is uh, following that. So by making it uh, on off state, okay, you will be able to put it in the arrangement like this and put your source in that, okay. As soon as you put the source here, if you are having frequency F1, you will be able to have that. These two will be able to propagate. These two will not allow it to propagate. And for the frequency two, the other, these two will allow it to propagate where the other two will not contact it. So this way now you will be able to manipulate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the beam variations. So this is called multi-beam lensing. Okay, this multi-beam beam lensing you, this is once again, as I mentioned, only thing is that uh, because of the equivalent parameters are very small, okay, even then if you calculate it, they all be equivalent to that of your lambda, okay. So when you take the photonic crystal concept, there also it is equivalently this can be done, okay, this was already done, okay, where no, depending on the frequency what you are being sent, you will be able to direct to the one region and then because we are using this metallic patches and the, uh, uh, the substrates so having a dielectric constant, you are able to reduce the dimension to a sub region. But still, okay, the concept wise, concept wise both are going to be the same. Another thing is uh, called the absorption, okay. So absorbers are very much useful uh, for the, uh, uh, to reduce the shear, side lobes or for shielding or uh, in a cold chambers. And you need to be very, you know, the, to have a very thin absorbers, okay. So another thing is, so it has to have broadband, etc. If you see the no-kite chambers, uh, you have a very broad band absorbers, okay? Mainly because no, uh, it is uh, using uh, uh, cones, etc., which are having a very broad band absorbing nature. So in the metamaterial, one will be able to use this uh, 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 arrangement, okay, to absorb the radiation. What is that you have to do is that to have a successful absorber, you have to create anti-parallel currents, okay, between the front and back layers. But, but as soon as you are having this uh, assonance formation, it will have an impedance match the surface. And then you have anti-parallel currents, which will try to absorb the radiation, okay? So the substrate has to have an absorbing nature. So with that, no, you will be able to get a very sharp bands, absorption peaks, et cetera. But then frequency-wise, not the bandwidth is very, very small. So how to improve the band, uh, the bandwidth? You, you increase the number of uh, resonances. So if they increase the number of resonances, then you will be able to uh, increase the band. So, but the problem is that whenever you are, most of the times what they do, they put a, a, a metallic structure on the top and the substrate and then put the back plane to be a reflector. So if that is the case, it is something called reflecting based. So reflection, so they will measure only the reflection coefficient and then they will say one minus S11 square will give you the absorption. But uh, whenever you are having the second side, which is not getting uh, uh, metallized, you have a transmission type, okay. When there's a transmission type, the, uh, the, the flow between the front layer and the back layer, okay, that's I told the parallel, parallel currents, okay, you may have to put the two different kind of uh, uh, structures here and that have to have an impedance matching on both sides, okay. So whereas in the other one, you have only one side of uh, thing propagation. So here it has to have a both sides of propagation. So this will become a kind of a bidirectional one. The bidirectional one, okay, you have, because of the multiple resonances involved in that, very with a very close uh, resonance frequency, you get a broader band. So here you are getting something around, around more than one gigahertz as a broad band, okay? So you'll be able to get an absorption values almost greater than that of 90%. Percentage. But then uh, people will start thinking, you know, can we decrease the uh, dimension further? Yes, it is possible if I'm using the high the permittivity substrate. So what we have used, we have used the barium fluoride, okay? For this particular combination. So barium titanate, put an ion into that. So, so you can say this is not a ferrite combination. So barium 
ion titanate you can say that so barium ion titanate can be used to uh, 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 for this particular purpose if you evaluate the dielectric permittivity and the permeability magnetic permeability you will get the values which will be having the loss values greater than that of the fr4 or for the regular things okay so you will be able to expect a kind of a, a higher absorption no doubt about that okay not only that the dimension also will be very very small so you can see that uh, the structure itself will be having a very small dimension okay the next one you will see that uh, this is a picture of that so giving a my the uh, unit cell itself is going to be much much lower and therefore you will be able to get the uh, thickness you now which is going to be of the order of uh, uh, 0.036 lambda c okay and uh, then this is having only one resonator with that uh, with the one resonator you will be able to find a broadband absorption of, uh, of around uh, so um, uh, you can say around 0.86 for 1.2 mm thickness and then 0.75 gigahertz for your uh, 1 mm thickness okay so this center frequency operation is around 10 gigahertz for both the cases okay so this is uh, giving you a kind of means what is advantage advantage is that you prepare your own material and then use it and this one if you see that this can withstand a temperature of more than around 600 degrees centigrade because it's a ceramic base okay only the metal is going to be troublous okay not the other things okay the metal should not get melted okay so otherwise uh, no our ceramic material will stand even up to around 1000 degrees okay so other one is one can use this for the ema shielding applications okay uh, as i mentioned whenever there is a ema shielding that's only thing is that you have to get the reflection to be larger but uh, there are certain absorption based ema shieldings also but this one is an fr4 substrate what we have developed is a ema shield can be used okay this is having very is the 2 mm only but still therefore we are not uh, excited much about that what we need is a thickness to be much much lower but compared to the double lambda this is smaller no doubt about it other important things going to be the chiral materials so chiral materials is another big topic where no one will be able to use it for polarization conversion so you take uh, the uh, you would have to, what you have to do is you have to only break the symmetry in, along the direction of propagation so we break the symmetry here and then try to excite uh, the radiation here and it gets coupled to the next one and then the polarization also changes okay so this is one structure what we used and then we find that you know the polarization regime will be around this particular shaded region will be that okay so we will be able to operate uh, your uh, polarization conversion in this particular shaded region okay so uh, if you see that uh, no another uh, structure is uh, having a uh, uh, variation like this the other side if you see that it will be rotated another way so you will be able to see the, uh, uh, the variations okay uh, like a simulation you will find the experimentation here what you do is you set the radiation on one polarization you will the output you will get the uh, uh, perpendicular polarization that means from x to y similarly the other side if you put it it will be rotating so this uh, reciprocal no doubt about that okay but you cannot use it for the isolation purposes so other thing is a broadband so there you can see a narrow band here you can have a broadband cross polarization okay uh, which by using a uh, plates like this okay this is the front side this is the back side so this is a fabricated this in the experimental results also we got it okay where you can see that the uh, that the polarization conversion approximately close to one means of more than that of 95 percent conversion efficiency okay so uh, this uh, uh, meta material you no know, the, uh, the uh, chiral meta materials play a very important role in that apart from that you no know, people are using it for energy harvesting okay where this uh, energy harvesting can be done by taking a simple resonator circuit and then tap the energy from that so uh, by making multiple uh, 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 resonators so you will be able to have a broadband absorption also so this is another important topic i think one of your uh, the speakers you know the designated at the ftp is actually uh, will be dealing more with this okay another important thing is called the topological metamaterials okay so we say topo we will not say topological metamaterial we say topological photonic crystals okay and uh, because the photonic crystals are highly anisotropic okay and then as i mentioned earlier no people do not use the magnetic uh, crystals mainly because magnetic materials are mainly because of the lossy nature okay but they also will have uh, uh, the advantage is that one can actually manipulate the direct permeability by using external magnetic field in fact uh, when we did this uh, uh, magnetic photonic crystal in uh, around 2003 or 2006 i think so uh, we could not use uh, magnetic field external magnetic field because the structure was huge 
but uh, nowadays you no know, we can uh, uh, we can actually fabricate uh, uh, a medium where you no know, we can reduce the time we can reduce the spacing etc but you know if i take the wig and then start doing this uh, theoretical one okay you will be able to find that you know uh, under the external magnetic field you will be able to have a, a tensor property of uh, mu r to be 14 and then k to be 12.4 whereas earlier it was going to be 1 okay so what happens is that this band structure if you calculate with the magnetic field this is without magnetic field and this is with the magnetic field that's a variation that means whenever it is allowing here here it doesn't allow so this type of tuning property can be done so that means by applying the magnetic field the band structure change can be used to, to have a kind of a uh, propagation property propagation variations okay so uh, what happens that you take a material which is having a egg, another one without having that put the source between that and try to switch it on you will find that you no know, by you switching on the magnetic field the propagation is going to be only along one direction so other direction is totally forbidden okay so yes, this is yes, the one Excuse me, sorry, sir, to interrupt you. Yeah. It's little time constraints. Yeah, yes, I am closing it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Another two minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay. Sure. So the, the propagation is uh, uh, prohibited in that. So this is uh, coming into the category of this topological materials. Okay. Are the topological photonic cells? Okay. So in order to understand the photonic, uh, the means topological uh, photonic cells, you may have to know about the CERN number. CERN number is you no. Know, the one which will decide about how many is the topological variance or the structure. For a simple mirror, it will be having zero, and if you have a complicated mirror, it depends on how much it is, it will be increased. So, what I do is, uh, in case a simple mirror, if it is there, it will have a simple dispersion. But if I have one mirror, another is not a simple mirror, okay, where you are going to have a, a certain number to be different, you will get a linear thing and dispersion, but it will have one direction propagation. So, these things no, they'll they will lack the mirror symmetry. Not only that, they'll have a, a rotational symmetry. So when there is a rotational symmetry, when this property happens, the wave cannot go back. So what it will do, it will bend around that. Okay, this is the property which is going to be useful in many applications. Okay. Uh, this is the one which we can realize regularly, okay, in our thing. We have also done once. Okay. So here you take two different uh, chiral structures. And, uh, so chiral metamaterials uh, are going to be the base for the topological metamaterials. Okay. So whenever you are having this chiral metamaterials, you will be able to see a kind of wild points. Wild points are the one where you, uh, you the two bands are going to touch each other. So these wild points also will give you this, uh, that uh, joining of two different short numbers. Okay, two two certain numbers the same thing. It will be going. You will find that such a variation, the wave can propagate through that in one direction. Okay, so this uh, this is another topic. You now people will be of uh, very much interest. Okay, people are working. Okay, we only thing is this must uh, people have to know about this uh, uh, the region of uh, uh, semiconductor physics, plus plus the solid state physics of that. Okay, so as I mentioned, that is another the way you know, how people have used in the photonic integrated circuits and that. Okay, so the last part you now, what all the publications we have done, I have given you the list here. Okay, and presently we are working on the uh, chiral metamaterials with the topological metamaterials as a concept. Another thing is we are also working on knee resonances where we do not have any metallic structures for the negative um, or metal free structures, you can say that. Okay, metal free structures we can do. As I mentioned already, that uh, photonic cells with the dielectric materials, uh, they already can possess the negative refractive index. Okay. So, with this, I would like to thank Dr. Vidya, Dr. Gordon, head of the ECE, Dr. Professor Amitban, for organizing this FTP on uh, microwaves. I also thank the management of SRMAP for giving me the opportunity. Okay. Thanks thank, a lot. Any thank questions? you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank I, you, sir. Really, I already see two questions in that. Okay. Yeah, yeah there real, are lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, uh, I'll, uh, I don't think we can take all of them. We'll yeah. take some of them. Yeah, okay. so I'll just unmute uh, Komal Prith. He, ha he has lots of questions. So she can directly ask anyone. Yeah, Komal Prith, you can unmute yourself and speak. Directly one question. Komal Prith, are you there? Uh, it's better uh, not ah, to yeah, see, yeah. you can yeah. speak otherwise we are wasting it <laughs> means we are spending a lot more time uh, am yes. i audible sir yes yes yes, ah, yes, yes. So, so my question is how can we use the matter material as a lens for the antennas 
okay as a lens for the antenna if you are going to do that okay uh, yes, for a metameter you are asking about the case of metameter what you do is you know uh, you may have to use uh, um, not a periodic one okay um, you, you as you go see this is a you have to use the concept of transmission means uh, transformational optics okay means what do you do is the graded index material i have shown you right i see the graded index material and yes, uh, uh, what is the what is the output of the so if it is a plane wave i have shown the green okay where you have a greatest uh, greater index in that and then there is a variation right yes. in case you are having this antenna which is having a variation like this okay you have to select each and the, the directions okay you have to select the direction and turn it around so what you need is a negative region no doubt but the angle which is what is important in that okay so it is not a single meta material uh, uh, structure may be uh, good for this i will say that multiple met, uh, unit cells okay but uh, they will be different but they will be arranged in a, in a periodic nature okay so, so if it is a, if it in case it is going to be a gaussian okay it is i say it is going to be rising like this okay you will have an angle is different right in the circle if you take it this will have a single direction other will have different directions so so you may have to arrange this meta material one structure here next structure like this to start making it it will be able to focus very effectively otherwise so, mm-hmm. yeah till can so uh, sir on what basis i can choose the matlab directions of the unit cell yeah i, I to, you have to actually check the uh, the band structure from the band structure you should be able to do that okay on the basis of band structure right yes 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 oh okay, thank yeah. you so much sir so uh i can take one more uh, rahul is asking what is intelligent reflecting surfaces for 6g communication future research direction in irs I, can you please uh, okay i'll again uh, so rahul rahul is asking what is intelligent reflecting surface for 6g communication future research direction in irs i i am not much familiar okay, okay. Uh, with this okay yeah so we can we can find somewhere uh, in other sessions uh, uh, rangarajan is asking sir is it possible to do all experiments with general microwave test bench setup or we have to use special hardware setups or something? no we can use uh, regular things yes you but only thing is you need to have a sweet Uh, you have to sweep the frequencies sir, and then uh, sir, no, sir, do that. Just uh, Gautam sir, I was sorry, Mandal sir, N K Mandal. Huh. Okay. So uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, someone is asking, uh, can you please explain how can we find out the inductance capacitance values for a meter surface? Ah, huh. okay. That is uh, from the uh, you take the response from that. Okay. and then uh, you uh, what we have done is uh, we can only have an uh, equivalent means uh, you say if it is a length you know you calculate the length and then put an equivalent value of inductance the capacitance how many length uh, lengths are there etc okay how many strips are there that many amount of inductance is have to be there first you list it and then you arrange them and then put it in the uh, software okay uh, where you no know, the, 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 the node is cheaper rf softwares are available you can put it into that and then check they both the things but that the output and these two are matching uh, otherwise one will be able to uh, i do not know whether there is any other softwares are available to do that where one can actually decode the out they like you know equivalent electric equivalent material properties what we get back similarly uh, one will be able to give different values of l1 c1 etc from there also one can get that okay these are all combinations of l c r so Okay, how many are there depends on the structure. Say five are there, you have to put five values and then start putting it and then uh, iterate it and get that things done. Uh, But I have not done till now. So Mahadevan is asking uh, using rods for different radius for varying refractive index is equivalent to the graded index material used in optical fiber. Can you please repeat yeah. the question? So using rods of di- for different various uh. uh, different radius. Uh, for varying refractive index is mm-hmm. equivalent is it equivalent to the graded index material Correct. used in optical fiber uh, right it is equivalent only it is e- they are equivalent yeah okay so i think we can one more question we can take uh, uh, suguna 
has raised her hand for long i'll just allow can you please speak suguna unmute and speak naneri suguna okay so i think uh yeah so i can just take one more last uh, sir if patch antenna dimension is being slotted on the ground plane on one side of a substrate uh, the, and microstrip feed line on the other side then ca uh, can we apply meta material plane amc uh, if can then uh, on which side uh, the substrate on which side of the substrate i, I generally I, am, I i don't do simulations okay so uh, this amc I, I, I do not have any idea about that because uh, the simulations are being done by uh, the students so i don't have any idea about that except okay, so that the boundary conditions are used generally used as that of the wavegate boundary conditions or if it is a meta material periodic boundary conditions So depending on situation we do that okay so i think so there are lots of more questions uh, i think we have to stop over here uh, there are now we can take so, some some other session uh, later on okay thank you sir thanks uh, very thanks. nice and informative talk uh, many family uh, present uh, the, our many of the attendees are also have appreciated that uh, okay so i think we will can have future collaboration and future uh, events like this and we can get it in uh, much more elaborations so i think uh, we'll thank from the organizing committee and srm now thanks so professor. so yeah i think we have already uh, with us uh, minal sir is already there so uh let me just uh, so i will be quick address uh, in introducing him uh so sir is there okay sir is there okay so so we can start immediately or just a break uh we can start oh uh, sir can you hear us mandal sir uh mandal sir are you are well able to listen to us uh, yes i i can okay sir. yeah now you are also audible uh, am i audible yes sir. Uh, yes okay. Uh, okay okay fine thank you okay so thank you sir uh <laughs> thank you one and all uh, this is dr gautam rana i would like to welcome on behalf of the organizing committee and uh, ec department srm ap uh professor minal kanti mondal uh, he is an associate professor uh, currently working in iit kharagpur he has received his btech and mtech degrees from institute of radio physics and electronics uh, uh, university of calcutta in 2001 and 2003 respectively and the phd degree he has received from the department of electronics and electrical communication engineering iit kharagpur in the year 2008 from 2007 to 2009 he worked as a research fellow in the institute for infocom research agency for science technology and research singapore he also worked as a postdoctoral fellow university quebec uh, montreal 2009 to 2010 uh, and in ecole polytechnique from uh, polytechnic de montreal 2010 to 2012 dr mondal is a senior member of ieee uh, to 2003 uh, 13 so he is uh, he is in the editorial board of wiley international journal for rf and microwave computer aided engineering he was in uh, the board of uh, organizing committee members of several international conferences he has also authored and co-authored over 110 journals and conference paper of which 42 are in different ieee journals he also he has also filed 11 patents his present research interest is co-design of active and passive components 
and their applications in recognizable antennas, millimeter wave imaging systems, beam forming networks, dipolar <laughs> Doppler radars, and six port uh, receivers. So with this, I would like to welcome Dr. Mandal in the panel, and uh, he, I will hand over the mic to him. So he may start. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Gautam, for your nice introduction. Let me share my slide first, and uh, I'll be switching on the video to save and do it. Otherwise, I may face some internet connection related issues. So can you see uh, in my slide in full screen mode? Can you please confirm it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, thank you very much, sir. Let's start. So I'm going to present on Rectena for RF power harvesting. Rectena basically a combination of an antenna and a rectifier. So it is expected that when RF power falls on an antenna, then the circuit it will deliver or better to say it will convert the RF power to DC energy. Now there is one similar application we use for uh, for sending RF power from one point to another point wirelessly. So I'm not considering here that scenario even though design approach is very much similar to it because for RF energy transfer from one point to another point uh, usually that uses high power condition. So that means on the antenna plane in, uh, in the receiving mode, uh, intense radiation intensity is much higher. And the efficiency of RF to DC conversion, it highly depends on the input power. So we are considering a different situation. It is purely for RF power harvesting. So that means uh, whatever RF power is available from different users, so that we are going to utilize it. So obviously, then the output DC energy it will be very small. And we cannot expect to drive a whole receiver or transmitter uh, section by using this RF power. Then what type of applications we, we can target? Some of the applications which require ultra low power typically in the range of a few tens to a few hundred microwatt. So uh, then SNR, it is directly related to the channel capacity or data rate. Then obviously we cannot expect a communication for a high data, rate, uh, high data rate communication for this type of applications. Then one possible application is different type of sensors like temperature sensor, pressure sensors, which does not require a high data rate link, but they can be placed at remote places and they can be charged by using the available RF power uh, from different type of applications. So keeping this point in mind, and this is the presentation flow actually, we are going to then uh, discuss about the rectana design. So after introduce, so this is the presentation flow, after introducing rectina, then how to design the heart of a rectina, which is very much similar to a detector design. So that uh, I'll be discussing in short. Then uh, how much DC power we are expecting from a rectina, a simplified analysis. Uh, this is just for an estimate, basically. Then some of different types of, different types of rectifiers and some advanced rectifiers for increased DC voltage or DC current. I'll be also discussing the measurement scheme of the rectina. The basic circuit, it looks like this. So the rectina, it works in the receiving mode. So as you can see, the very first component is the receiving antenna and it is followed by the rectifier. And in between, we have a matching circuit. This, what is the function of this matching circuit? This is to transfer maximum power from left-hand side to right-hand side. So some of this power will be converted to DC. And in addition to DC, we have the fundamental frequency component as well as its harmonics. So obviously then 
this analysis technique it involves nonlinear analysis. So that is why to isolate DC and for high rejection for the RF frequencies, we'll be using a low pass filter. Then right hand side, we have the DC voltage or current available. Now we need a power management unit. So as I said that the input power level is very small, then uh, in most of the case, we'll be storing it uh, maybe in a super capacitor or in a, or in a capacitor bank. And then when required, it will be connected to the sensor or other circuit where we need this power or we can utilize this power. Now, typical conversion efficiency, RF to DC, it is very low, 10% uh, to 40% even after uh, proper design. And that is why, as I said, since uh, it is a low power application, we can only target some uh, maybe IoT based sensor like temperature sensor or pressure sensor, which does not require a continuous data flow, only a burst of data flow. So when the circuit will be on, it will send some data. Then again, it will go to the uh, storage mode and, and so on. So therefore we need a power management circuit here. So mostly it is implemented by a switch controllable switch. So a controller is also connected to it. Then what type of applications we can target? IoT, other than that, smart building or some of the medical devices we can target. So here I uh, am showing a picture of a practical rectenna. So you can identify eight series fed array antennas and the bottom side in the rectangle, here we have the rectifier circuit. And since the output, it is now DC, then the power management circuit, control circuit, and the storage part, it is implemented on a different PCB, which is connected by simply wired to this circuit. So, well, now uh, before coming to the actual design, let us have some idea. What are the typical frequency bands available? So obviously then we need to design the rectenna at those available bands. And what are the typical uh, radiation intensity we can expect? So we can compare this value with some well-known sources like the sun. The sun is a very good radiator and radiation intensity is quite high compared to our applications. In outdoor scenario, we can expect an average uh, energy of the order of 10 milliwatt per square centimeter. And in indoor scenario, usually it is much lower. Um, it is less than 0.1 milliwatt per square centimeter. The energy available in, uh, for acoustic uh, power, it is much lower and we cannot utilize as such. Now for mobile phone base stations, it is continuously radiating. So we can target this application. And I'm showing here a typical value considering 500 meter distance from the base station antenna, uh, a 0.1 microwatt per square centimeter. So it is quite low. And it is slightly better for the Wi-Fi application and indoor scenario. Uh, it is 0.001 milliwatt per square centimeter. Now, in India, these are some of the well-known bands. For example, 2G, it works at 900, 1800 megahertz band. Then CTMA and WCTMA, 850, 900, and 2100. 4G LTE, we have several frequency bands. So when then we are going for the rectina design, we can concentrate on these bands. And uh, before that, actually, we need to fix where we'll be using this because some of the bands may not be available in that place. Now, when the distance is varied from the base station, the received radiation intensity, it widely varies. So here, this top right figure, it shows a major variation of radiation intensity with distance from the base stations. This is for one point eight gigahertz application, 4G LTE. Now near the base station, it is quite high, but as we go to a higher range, then this power decreases. 
So in this case, it does not accurately follow the Fries equation, or we, we can say that uh, in the coefficient, but at plus coefficient, it is not exactly two, usually less than two. And because of fading and other effects at one point at a, a fixed distance, uh, again, the intensity can vary over a wide range. So that is why this variation is shown by an arrow. And it can vary even over a range of one to 100 times, as you can see from this figure. So therefore, for the RF harvesting, power harvesting application in India, we can target these mobile frequency bands considering these studies. Then for a practical rectina, we need to improve somehow the RFTC efficiency. So I'm coming to that point later. So we can start from the antenna, then we have the matching circuit, and after that, we have the rectifier. So this rectifier, it is not like the low frequency rectifier. Why? Because the input power level is very high, then whatever voltage generated here, that cannot cross the new voltage of the diode then it is very close to the detector design. So better then let me show the detector, then I'll come back here. Now for a RF power detector, we need some diode which has very low parasitic capacitor as well as low knee voltage or low cut-in voltage. So the good candidate is then a short key barrier diode as shown here. Then we can use a short key barrier diode to design a detector rectifier circuit, but this short key barrier diode, it is inferior as a rectifier, as you can see from the PI characteristics when it is compared to a PN junction diode. So in the reverse voltage condition, reverse saturation component is a few hundred times higher than the conventional PN junction diode. But what we need actually, we need the nonlinear properties of the short key diode. And short key diode has the advantage of low cutting voltage and low parasitic capacitance. Then we can utilize it to design the detector diode. Now, in most of the cases, it will not cross the new voltage. Then the variation will be with respect to zero for a zero biased short key diode. And the output voltage waveform, we can expect something like this. Now, if we take the average value or DC value, we can see that we have some finite DC content here. We can also add a, 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 a filter circuit here, a capacitor, then the output DC content, it will increase. So this is a single diode based detector circuit. At the output side, we have the load resistance and the capacitor C. And top right here, I'm showing a photograph of a detector circuit designed and implemented in our lab. So if you look at the circuit, so antenna will be connected at the SMA port. Now the, at the input side, we have a matching network. Then this black dot, it is the short key diode. And at this arm, we are using the C and this arm it is connected to the register. Then at the output side, we have simply DC voltage. Now the arm length, actually it is not arbitrary. They have been optimized by using uh, ADS simulation software. So if we plot the output voltage with the input power, then for any detector, we know that we have two regions. For low power, we have the square region. And for high power, we have the linear region. So most of our application, it will be confined to this square region only because the input power level is low. Now for a detector, we define one important parameter. We call the sensitivity of the detector, gamma. It is the slope of this transfer characteristics curve and represented in millivolt per microwatt. So this gamma, it is usually constant when plotted against B in, in logarithmic scale. And it depends on different condition. 
So here we'll be con uh, considering zero bias case. We are not going to use any biasing circuit for power harvesting application, but it highly depends on device temperature and other device parameters. Then to improve this conversion efficiency, first of all, we need a high power transfer from left-hand side to the diode. So we need the IO matching. Now, when we call simply impedance matching, we consider a frequency range, but here the design is not that straightforward. From the input side, let's say we are using 1800 megahertz frequency band, but it now passes through the diode and you know that it follows that exponential relationship, which we can represent by a power series. The first term is the DC term. Then we have the fundamental component as well as its harmonics at the output. And for this input or output matching circuit, our main target is to maximize the DC power available here. Then this is not like a conventional input output matching circuit design, or it is not a linear design. We have to consider nonlinear analysis. So in ADS, we do it by using harmonic balance analysis. And the main target of which is to minimize power available at the fundamental operating frequency and its harmonics. So at the output side, we want to maximize the uh, DC voltage or DC energy. So then it depends on the RC value as well. It's only higher R and C, it provides uh, higher efficiency. And uh, device parameters, input power level, and ambient conditions, among other. All these design steps and other things we can skip for now. And if it requires, if time permits, then we can go through it later. So as I was discussing then for the input matching or output matching network, we simply cannot use the S parameters. So S parameters, they are defined only at the design frequency, but now we are dealing with DC as well as the fundamental frequency and its harmonics. This is harmonic balance. And I'm showing here finally another design. Uh, it was designed for rectina application with uh, improved conversion efficiency on the RF part. Now the input matching and output matching circuit actually it has been changed for improved efficiencies. So uh, as you can see here, we have integrated a band stop filter at the output of this short key diode and it takes care of all the, uh, uh, the first uh, three harmonic frequencies. So whatever it actually provide high or low impedance uh, to the har at harmonic frequencies. And then this power is reflected back from this end and it puts us back to flow through the diode again. And in that procedure, it will generate some DC which will add up. This is to improve the conversion efficiency. This is some basic idea on a detector. Now I'm coming back to that original circuit. Then antenna, in this particular circuit, I'm taking it from this paper. It is connected to two different loads. The first one, it is called the startup loop. And the second one, it is called the optimum loop. Now, as the input power, it changes, we can refer to that PI characteristics, then the operating point, it changes. If the operating point changes, then the input impedance of the circuit will also change. So if the input impedance changes, then the max, uh, the power transfer from antenna to the diode, it will also change. So it highly depends on the input power. And if input power level, it varies, then we should change the load condition accordingly. Otherwise, we cannot maximize the conversion efficiency. So we need some sort of control circuit here, and we can use the concept of load modulation at the antenna terminal. The concept is somewhat similar to power amplifier circuit. Now, 
we need some initial power because we are considering RF power harvesting. We don't have any other sources of power. So we need a minimum received power, which we call the wake up power to operate this circuit. And that is why first a startup load is designed. It is an oh. optimum load considering the different input power levels mm -hmm. available at that place. That, and then uh, we need to go through a uh, rigorous measurement of the available radiation intensity at that places, uh, at that place. And accordingly, we can have here two or three parallel load circuits. And depending on the input power level, then we can switch it on, means the required, uh, the optimum load condition can be switched on for maximum power transfer. So once it is done, then the bottom side startup load condition, it is switched off, and now it operates for maximum power transfer or uh, under the optimum load. Now, after this, we have the DC voltage available here, but finally, we need to drive some sensor and sensor uh, voltage requirement can be different. Some of them can may require, let's say uh, 1.8 volt, some of them three volt, uh, some of them five volt and so on. But here the output voltage, we do not have a direct control. So we need another control circuit to change this voltage level to the required voltage level. And that is why usually people use a DC DC converter at this stage. And again, the input impedance of the DC DC converter, it is directly coming parallel to this capacitor. So that will directly affect this RF design. Then we need similar arrangement like this startup load or optimum load for the DC DC converter as well. So we have the startup circuit here, uh, again, designed at some optimum power level. And for this one, the input impedance is fixed. Now, when this minimum power is available for wake up, it will be switched on. It will check the input power level and accordingly, it will switch on the corresponding uh, required DC DC uh, converter. We call it pushed converter. And finally, the optimum DC energy is available. So this switch, it is usually CMOS based switch. Then, so in most of the design, at least for us as RF engineer, we only consider the front end part till rectifier design. But sometimes we forget about the DC DC converter. But we should keep that point also in mind. So here is the example how the output voltage or current uh, it uh, they depends and the overall RF to DC efficiency depends on the condition of DC DC converter. So this curve, for this curve, it, it this shows the uh, voltage variation with the load current and the corresponding efficiency, it is plotted here. So from this, we uh, this is for a fixed input power level, of course. And from this, what we can conclude that we cannot simply say for high voltage or high current efficiency will be highest. An optimum condition exists. And we need to find out then what is the corresponding current or voltage for this optimum condition so that eta RF to DC, it becomes highest. And accordingly, we need to design the upper DC DC converter uh, or uh, um, Accordingly, we need to select the appropriate DC DC converter for boost operation. Now, as I said, the input power level, it also plays an important role. So you can see here, overall eta RF to DC in percentage, it is plotted along Y uh, with load condition. So the load values, this is in kilo ohm. Now, the efficiency is, it is shown at three different power levels. So for P average, when it is minus 10 dBm, so it is uh, shown by the dashed line, then for minus 50 dBm by dotted line, and minus 20 dBm, this is by the solid line. So this efficiency highly depends on the load condition. 
and as well as the input power level. Uh, now, uh, okay, so this switch, another important component is switch, but low power, ultra low power switch or ultra low power DC-DC converter actually available in market. One example, uh, mini circuit CSWA2 63DR. So this SPDT switch, it consumes 20 microwatt of power. So it is implementable, this circuit. Now, what should be the targeted power level? It depends on the sensor specifications. So just to give you some idea, uh, what is the typical power level required by different sensors? So I'm showing some data from literature in this table. And they already designed it for some specific mobile frequency band. For example, the first one, it is targeted for 868 megahertz band. And this sensor, it requires a minimum power level of minus 55 dBm uh, for a wake up, uh, for a reliable wake up event. And this sensor has a data rate of 10 kbps, 10, 10 kbps when switched on. Uh, power consumption is not reported in this paper and they used diode technology for the rectina design. Similarly, uh, let us see, let's say another one, this one, it is targeted, uh, targeting 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi application. And this sensor, it requires minus 50 dBm of power for a reliable wake up event. It also uses on off keying and data rate when it is on 100 kbps and power consumption 2.4 micro watt. And this is for the sensor only. And it is implemented in 180 nanometer CMOS technology. So if we follow the typical power consumption, it is in a few micro watt to tens of micro watt. Then we can have actually proper utilization of RF power harvesting for some specific applications. We cannot target all of the applications, but the applications which requires very small amount of power, we can target them. Now, as I was telling that SNR, it directly determines the data rate. Since it's a low power uh, application, we cannot target a high data rate uh, uh, wireless link or, or the sensor which requires a high data rate. And since the radiated power from the sensors will be small, then it will be mostly for short range application and typical example, other than temperature or pressure sensor, we can also use it for earthquake detector and some of the medical devices. Okay, so detected part, if you are interested, then we can uh, discuss it in details later. Otherwise, for now, I'll be uh, skipping this part. Uh, I can see some uh, comment here. Just let me quickly go through it. Okay. Uh, okay. This question, mostly the questions so we can. Yeah, sir. Uh, the third. Consider it later. Yeah. So the th third question is for this session, and uh, Jeet Banerjee's question is for this session. Others uh, were actually directed to the previous session. Yeah, yeah, that sensitivity and other things. So this is general question. We can take it later. So uh, means I wanted to know actually which part you are interested in because uh, this lecture it is for two to three hours, and uh, I'll be shorting it to one hour. So some of the parts obviously I'll be skipping. Well. Now, how to have some estimate for the DC power, considering only the RF part, antenna and the rectifier. Now for antenna, one important parameter is antenna factor, which this parameter we also use for EMI EMC measurement case. So the same parameter is used here. Here, what we consider, the antenna is operating 
in the receiving mode and it is mass terminated the 50 ohm load then we need to measure what is the electric field intensity on the antenna plane and what is the voltage generated across this 50 ohm load so if we can measure this two data we can calculate antenna factor now considering free space impedance 377 ohm and the power dissipation is pd then we can also relate this antenna factor to this equation so putting this value we have in the simplified from 2.75 divided by square root of ae where ae this is the effective aperture of an antenna now for an antenna if the gain is given and we know the operating wavelength then we can directly calculate ae it is lambda square by 4 pi into g and ae it depends obviously on gain as well as the operating frequency so once we have the ae data then we can estimate what will be the output voltage so receiving aperture it plays an important role then if single antenna element if it is not enough we can go for array design to intercept more power so instantaneous average power over a range of frequency so when we are targeting a mobile frequency band application uh, we have a range of frequency then we are taking average power uh, over this it can be given by this expression so we need to integrate it from some low, lowest frequency to the highest frequency of the band over the entire solid angle the radiation intensity into the effective antenna aperture for t omega tf then the dc power at any frequency ptc it is the incident rf power multiplied by eta conversion efficiency so where eta it is defined by the ratio of dc power divided by the incident rf power and eta it is a function of input power then the impedance of both the rf impedance and the low, uh, low frequency circuit impedance and other factors so we call this as the conversion efficiency we did not consider polarization mismatch here uh, if further we want to introduce polarization loss then we have this polarization factor cos i square so this is the maximum possible voltage otherwise sometimes it is not changing this conversion efficiency then this is the most important factor for any rectina which directly tell us how efficient is antenna rectifier systems and from some of the plots we have already seen it highly depends on the input power i'm also showing it in one more case let's say we have a half wave rectifier and we are considering uh, for two frequency bands 0.9 gigahertz and 1.85 gigahertz then after optimum design this is the variation of efficiency with the input power level so what we see then the efficiency is highest for a specific input power the same thing is true for a full wave rectifier as well so it depends on the input power and again input power it depends on the distance from the base station or the radiation intensity at the antenna plane direction of arrival and polarization now once the antenna parameter is done then next we need to consider the next part of the circuit which is the input matching then type of rectifier we can use half wave rectifier full wave rectifier next right hand side after rectifier termination so that termination also directly determines the efficiency and operating frequency operating frequency why it is important mostly it determines the loss from the circuit so for any pcb based design particularly if we increase the operating frequency you know that all the three component of losses increase for example conductor loss that will increase with frequency dielectric loss uh, surface wave loss all of them will increase with frequency so 
So obviously then if we uh, design this at millimeter wave frequencies, then the efficiency will be much lower. So all these parameters, they will directly affect the RF to DC conversion efficiency. Here are some rectifier example. So this is the basic short key based detector, single diode detector. We can use two diodes in solution configuration, but still it works as a half wave rectifier. If we use further and one more capacitor at the input side, it will work as a voltage doubler. So we have the advantage that we can double the voltage. And this is another example, a parallel diode case, but we need to then consider when the first diode, it is uh, plus is applied and for the second diode minus is applied. So input should be differential. Well, uh, differential part, uh, let me see, I most probably I did not input. Okay, well, we have one example later, that time we'll be discussing. So for differential case, we can double the voltage. Now, this is an extension of low frequency bridge rectifier. So RF power, it is divided into two parts and they are connected to two diodes. Two more diodes, they sit in between. So the circuit implementation scheme, it uh, looks like this, this circuit, as you can see here, RF in, then we have here two parallel diodes and two more parallel diodes here. And in between we have the matching circuit. Right side also, we have the low pass filter termination. It is the radial stub uh, to reflect the fundamental frequency components mostly. So it behaves like a low pass filter. Now coming to the simple circuit representation, this midpoint of the circuit, this point here, uh, where one more stub is connected, this point, it behaves like a virtual ground. Then we can consider this point is positive when this point is negative in one half cycle. In next half cycle, then this point is negative, this point is positive with respect to this point, of course, right side, I am considering uh, the reference point. Then when this point is positive with respect to this, then the signal, it goes through the first diode, through load, then it comes back here to brown. It follows the blue arrow. Now, when it is negative, then we need to start from here and it goes through the diode again through the load, then it comes back through the diode here. So through the register, what we see that the current always in the same direction. Then we can utilize both of the hub of input RF signal. So obviously then the efficiency will be higher compared to the single three diode case. But of course, the design will be much more complicated. Now we are considering four diodes instead of uh, just one diode. <clears throat> Similarly, some of the low frequency concept like voltage stapler, voltage tripler, or voltage quadrupler can be extended even to RF frequencies. And in fact, some of the researchers, they implemented this type of circuits. But only problem is that the optimization, it takes long time. So other than this, we have some other solutions where instead of using multiple diode and capacitors, they use multiple antennas. And then the voltage generated by the antenna port uh, if we add them, let's in series connection, that can also increase the voltage. Or if we simply use them in shunt configuration, that can increase the current. So that is more common actually. So here is one example, again, from uh, this paper in 2013. They are using a poor antenna element, two by two antenna element as the basic design block. And as you can see here, these two antennas, they are connected to a single fit, similarly the bottom side. Now, let's say at any instant, electric field, it is in upward direction, as shown by these arrows. Then it matches with the antenna polarization. Antenna will receive the maximum power and maximum voltage is generated here. 
But the problem is, for the top antenna, it is in upward direction, but the bottom antenna, it is in downward direction. So for one case, it is plus, then the other case, it is minus. Now, if I consider two points, here, this fit point and this fit point, then we have a differential signal. Now, in the circuit, what they do, the ground plate also, uh, they, cut a, they, they cut a slot in, in the ground plate. It, it, it looks like a slit. They are not connected to each other. Where they'll be putting a SMT capacitor. Now, a diode is put here in between two fit lines. So this diode is facing then a differential signal. Then what is the advantage? That the plus sign, let us consider uh, at one point of the sinusoidal curve. Okay, maybe I can refer to this diagram. Let's say this is the input wave. So for one diode, one side, if this is positive, then the other side, since it's differential, it will face the negative one. So effectively, then if I take the voltage difference, it becomes twice compared to a single diode scenario. And that's how uh, we can have direct voltage multiplication from this circuit. Now we need to complete the circuit. So this diode part, it should be connected to the capacitor part. So the right hand side picture, it is showing the cross sectional view. So this diode is connected between two fit lines and one SMT capacitor in the slit. Now we need to complete the circuit. We need a connection between this top fit to ground. Now, if I directly put a metal PI here, that will short the RF part. Then we use the uh, bias T design concept here. And what they did, they used a lambda by four lines before putting the short. Then this short circuit, it is transformed to open circuit here. So with respect to DC, a low frequency, it will be short, this length is nothing. But at the RF operating frequency, since this length, it is quarter of length, this short circuit is transformed to open circuit at this point, similarly at the bottom one. And we do not have any load at the RF frequency because the input impedance looking into the star arm, it is infinite. So that is how the design is complete. Now, if we need further voltage amplification or current amplification, we can use them in series or shunt configuration. So here for this example, they are repeating the same block n times, and then we can connect the ground plane. So when we are connecting the ground plane, this is for DC. And we need to consider with respect to DC then. So this ground plane is connected to this ground plane considering the sign. So this diode, top diode, it is plus to minus. We need to follow next again plus to minus like a battery. So that's how we complete the series design. And finally, then the output we take from this point and the rightmost point here. And the voltage generated between two extreme points, it is N into P. So this is a direct, uh, it is a better design compared to the uh, voltage coupler tripler cases. Because we are at the same time, we are also increasing the receiving aperture. Similarly, we can have this type of connection also, this alternate series connection. So the second block, it is inverted. It is flipped down, as you can see here, the direction of diode is different. And that's why the DC connection, uh, it is different. Similarly, we can have current amplification. And in this case, they are connected in parallel, as you can see here. In the bottom case, uh, using that, flipped geometry, so first one, then the second one facing opposite direction, and they are using then cross connection to have the current in the same direction. And then the total current component, it will come from all the points, and it is N into I, where N is the number of elements. Now, for this example, the output DC voltage for the these two examples, series connection and alternate series connection. Then the output DC voltage, it is plotted with respect to RF power density. 
at the receiving antenna plane in watt per meter square for 5.8 gigahertz uh, mobile frequency band. And as you can see here, bottom side it is for single unit using the uh, triangles and for different load conditions, 560, 470, 390. So as the load value decreases, DC voltage increases with increasing power density, but it is not a linear function. Now, if we consider the series parallel connection, it more or less follows the same procedure. And for the alternate series connection, or regular series connection, then the voltage, it is multiplied by N, and then that, that's why it is increasing. But as you can see here, the first part, it remains linear as the power density increases, but then it looks like it is saturating. So actually you need to change the matching condition and nothing. We need to redesign it. So more or less then for, series connection, uh, sorry, for the regular series connection or alternate series connection, we can say that it works, I mean, the voltage linearly increases as the input power increases, or in other words, you can say that conversion efficiency, uh, it can be within a uh, low variation range over a range of input power. But obviously, we need to fine tune the load values. Okay, we do not have enough time. Now, uh, the measurement technique in short, it is not like conventional antenna measurement. What we are expecting that the incident power will be the RF power. And at the output side, we need to measure the DC voltage. And if you want to measure the efficiency, then DC voltage and current. So in this system, then we can use the same antenna positioner which we use for antenna measurement. So uh, the, for this system, a horn antenna is used as the transmitter and the rectenna under test, it is placed on the antenna positioner and we can measure the output voltage uh, by connecting a simply voltmeter or a multimeter. And that will give the, it is across the register so we can calculate the DC power here. Then the, polar, the, the, the variation of receive power with respect to theta or pi or with respect to polarization, everything can be done. Well, so let's stop here. And if you have any specific interest, then you can ask me or you can send me over also email later. So let's stop here. Thank you all. And now let us take a few question answer. Thank you, sir, for very enlightening and informative lecture. I would like to call uh, Dr. Yeah. Indra Nil yeah. uh, to take up the question from the audience. Okay, I, I can see few questions. So let me uh, answer that from chat box. Then maybe I can take a uh, few more. So from Jayaraman, uh, how to connect or interface rectina with sensor? Now, it is not actually any RF design. At the output of the rectina, already we have DC voltage. Then the sensor, it will give you some finite input impedance and it becomes a DC design as we do. For DC design, usually uh, what we need, either uh, DC voltage source or DC current source. We do not use maximum power transfer theorem. Then the input impedance of the sensor, either it should be high or low. That will give you the best situation. RF power is it? Okay, so one more. A question from Madhupuri Kishore. RF power received by antenna is normally very weak. Then how the rectification is done? Yeah, that is correct. And I, I let me 
I think you can still see my slide. How to close the chat? Okay, fine. I can do this. So I would refer to the PI characteristics here. Now consider this blue line and the input voltage variation with respect to this y axis. Now, if it is very large, we'll be having a very nice looking rectified output. When it is very small, particularly, let's say the variation, peak to peak variation, it does not cross the cut in voltage, then it does not look like a rectified output, what we see in basic electronics lab zero. It is different, but the corresponding impedance, it is changing in the positive hub or negative hub. So it will be much more deformed sinusoidal wave, but still we can take the average. So just looking at the curve, then we consider the area under the positive cycle and area under the negative cycle. Then our target is to maximize this difference in area. And if there is some difference in area that obviously uh, provides the DC. So this curve, it won't look like this. It will be much more deformed than this, but still we have some DC component. So that is why it is very much sensitive to input power level. Now let's say you have optimized the load condition through harmonic balance analysis for a given input power and next input power level is changing. So obviously you need now a different load condition. So that is why it depends on input power level as well as the load condition. Yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more question from Bucci Babu. Can we design rectena in ANSYS HFSS? HFSS in, uh, okay, this is a tricky. It won't be very accurate, but still we can. Since in HFSS, uh, you can uh, draw equivalent circuit using register capacitor. So it is better you use uh, designer if you want to use ANSYS and we use ADS. Then the direct device model, we can, uh, as a symbol, uh, we can import it to ADS schematic window. Same thing is true for ANSYS designer. Yeah, I think one Sir, more question um, is from Jeet Energy is there. Uh, it's a basic question. So uh, he's asking uh, when we take uh, teach feedback uh, in basic analog electronic circuits. We test them about sensitivity and uh, desensitivity. Any ana uh, analogy between sensitivity shown here and the one we studied in the feedback networks? Sensitivity, this is a general term. Now it is related to the input and output. For our application, we need to check what is the input and what is the output. Here we are considering the input power level or the radiation intensity as the input and DC uh, energy as the output. Then uh, again, what type of feedback? It is a uh, transfer characteristics you are considering or voltage gain you are considering or current gain you are considering. You see, so simply it is the relationship between the input and output. So what is the change in output due to some unit change in input? That is related to sensitivity, right? Yeah. Okay, sir, one sir, question we, from oh. my side, uh, just a very, <laughs> so it's a very far-fetched one. Uh, so, uh, so since uh, there are many sources, uh, many things, many human beings, and uh, also so we radiate uh, infrared, so can we design a rectenna? Uh, obviously, the sensor uh, levels are much lower there. So nanowatts and picowatts. So can we gen uh, design a rectenna for a uh, far infrared kind of uh, applications where well, uh, well, we can yeah, tap in you. the energy? Oh, okay, thank you. I, I, I need to give you some numerical figures. Otherwise, you will not understand this. You see, I, uh, that's why I started with the example of radiation intensity for the sun during daytime. Of course, the average value is typically 10 milliwatt per 
uh, uh, per cent square centimeter. Now, the sun, uh, whatever energy it is radiating, the corresponding frequency it follows the Planck's black body radiation law. So it depends on the surface temperature. But the sun, it is 6,000 6, Kelvin, and the peak, it comes at visible wavelength. But not that it is not radiating any microwave or millimeter frequency range or infrared frequency range. So if you uh, go through the uh, intensity curve, uh, compared to visible wavelength, we need to check. I do not remember the uh, difference, but the infrared and millimeter wave, I remember it is actually 10 to the power seven to 10 to the power eight times down. Now for ground object, the peak it comes, uh, considering 300 K, let's say as the surface temperature, the peak it comes uh, in infrared range, but still uh, it will be much lower compared to the energy from uh, base stations, mobile phone. So then uh, means it would be difficult, but we have night vision and other things that uses this passive radiation, right? Yeah. At the infrared sir, frequency range. Yes. Questions are from my side. Sir, what is the limitation of this retina? Like, um, it can it be used only for single frequency band as we are incorporating here uh, this converter circuit? No, no. Like, uh, uh, yeah. You have given one example of differential retina. So there we have used the uh, one stub that is converting, uh, uh, means making uh, short to open. So, uh, sir, is it limitation? We can uh, like we can capture the energy only in the single frequency band, uh, or we can design it to uh, capture multiple frequency band and to convert in DC power. Yes, of course. That is a good question. Uh, you see. It depends on the matching and better here I cannot directly use the concept of matching since you are considering harmonic balance analysis and your main target is to minimize energy uh, available or wasted in the unrequired bands. Now, uh, using the simple term matching, I can explain your query from let's say S101 data. But this detector, whatever I'm showing here, you can see the S101 uh, impedance matching bandwidth is very narrow. So how narrow it will be depends on the input reactance variation, right? Now, usually for a wide band design, we intentionally introduce some loss and the reactance variation is much lower. So in that case, if we follow the same procedure, then the problem we'll be facing that conversion efficiency will decrease. So conversion efficiency won't be high for wide band design. Then what is the solution? You can target dual band uh, uh, maybe application or maximum triple band application and the impedance matching circuit, you need to design it for dual band. So some mm -hmm. of the people already did it actually. So instead of uh, let's say a straight step, you can use stepped impedance step and consider the matching at two different frequency range. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, so we have to end over here. So the next uh, speaker is already there. Uh, so thank you, sir, for a very uh, nice and yeah, thank you all. Talk. Uh, we can definitely keep in touch with him uh, for any future. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, currently, actually, I'm writing a proposal on this. Uh, surely, sir, we, we need your guidance some places. We will keep in touch with you, sir. Please. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm sharing my email ID. So uh, for the participants also, if you have any query or anything else, you can directly write email to me. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you all again for yeah. your attention. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I'll hand over the mic now to uh, Indanil, sir, again, to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Dr. Ravi, Ravi Dattagupta. Gupta. Okay. So Hello everyone, myself uh, Dr. Indani Ladai. I'm an assistant professor in the department of EC, SRM AP. So I welcome uh, Dr. Ravi Datta Gupta for his lecture uh, on the topic of this recent developments in dielectric resonator antennas for futuristic applications uh, in the faculty development program. Uh, recent trends on microwaves and beyond techniques. Okay. So I'll just let me introduce uh, Dr. 
uh, Ravi Dutta Gupta passed, then uh, I will just hand over the session to him. Uh, Dr. Ravi Dutta Gupta received his B and M Tech degree in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Rajiv Gandhi Technical University, Opal, India in 2002 and 2007 respectively. He has completed his doctoral research in 2018 from the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, IIIT DM, Jabalpur. At present, he is working as Senior Antenna Designer, Design Engineer at Ace Antenna India Private Limited, Hyderabad. Before this, he was associated with the Defense Institute of Advanced Technology, Pune, as an assistant professor. He was working in an elect electronics manufacturing unit during 2003 to 2005. He has worked as a research associate with the Center for Applied Research in Electronics, IIIT Delhi, from 2007 to 2010. He also has worked as a researcher in NIT Rao Kela. He is an active reviewer of several reputed journals. He is a senior member of IEEE and served as chair and treasurer of IEEE Micro Actuary and Technics Student Branch Chapter, IIIT DM Jabalpur. Presently, he is volunteering as a slate member of IEEE AP, MTT, and EMC Joint Chapter, Hyderabad. His research interests include array antennas, base station antennas, dielectric resonator antennas, reconfigurable antennas, microwave integrated circuit, and EMI EMC. He has authored and co authored several national and international publications in peer reviewed journals and conferences. So, his vast experience, I hope that he will share with all the participants along with us and we will be benefited by his, this experience. So with that, I will just let the session to be handed over to Dr. Ravi Dutta. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ravi uh, for this nice introduction. Okay, can I share my thank screen? You, yes. I have the right? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so let me know once you can see the see my screen. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Andranil, for this introduction. And I also like to thank Dr. Gautam and Dr. Divya for inviting me here and uh, sharing my knowledge and thoughts on uh, today's topic, which is uh, recent developments in dialectic resonator antennas for futuristic applications. Right. So for next one hour, we will be talking about dielectric resonator antennas for uh, and basic characteristic and all those things and for application based uh, perspective also. Right. So, yeah, let me start. So this will be the outline for okay, how to minimize this. Is that any help, sir? No, no, no issue. And this panel was coming actually fine. I put it down. Yeah, so this is the outline of today's presentation. Uh, we will be having some background and introduction to dielectric resonant antenna, and I'll call in short it is as a DRA, like because the name is too long. So then we will have uh, the significance or the we will see the unique properties which DRA offers to us, like in comparison of other antennas, what it has the specialty, so that we should prefer DRA over the other kind of antennas. Then we will see the requirement of wideband DRAs. And in that case, we will see some techniques to increase the bandwidth of dielectric resistor antennas. In that, we will touch upon the liquid DRA, differential fed DRA, and special shape DRA, which is also known as modified geometry dielectric resonator antennas. Then we will see, we'll go for the application part. So here we will see some work uh, done by the researchers for targeting different applications. So in that uh, I've covered a uh, uh, small, uh, you know, that uh, number of applications that base station, 5G IoT and RF energy harvesting application also. Otherwise also there are many applications where DRA is being uh, used, right? Uh, then I will be concluding my talk. So just to have a uh, background before starting this. Uh, so if we discuss the background of DRAs, let me tell you that how it all started. So before actually 1980s, around 1980s, it was only dielectric resonator. It was not an antenna, it was not used as an antenna because it is a highly, as its name suggests, it is a resonant structure. 
so it is highly resonant at that time and it was uh, used uh, as a circuit element in the circuit applications as filter or as uh, in oscillators right so at that time it was basically put inside a shielded cavity with high value of uh, permittivity material so it was used as the circuit elements to store the energy it was used for the storing the energy then what happened then uh, the that uh, the researchers at that time they were struggling with the losses uh, some kind of leakage losses they have noticed that in in this case and uh, as it is a circuit uh, uh, element it should not give more losses right so they were struggling with that so out of those researchers some researchers started to explore the possibility uh, whether it can be used as an antenna it can be used as a radiator because the losses are basically the energy uh, radiating into the free space right so uh, the, the that 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 particular group of uh, uh, researchers they started exploring these things they removed that cavity and they saw that okay the losses are increased basically from the circuit point of view so the losses are increased which means the more energy is getting radiated into the free space then they explore all those things they measure the pattern properly excited all the modes and all, all those things then they finally published a paper in 1983 uh, that was named that was basically regarding the uh, dielectric cavity antenna based on a cylindrical shape of a dielectric resonator so that's all how it all started and since then uh, we have seen a large you know, a lot of progress in this field and it is getting popular day by day right so we will see okay so yeah if we talk about the introduction so so if we can say we can say okay it is a simply a high permittivity dielectric material it is a piece of high permittivity material it could be of any shape uh, some basic shapes are some shapes are presented in this figure also and this is a very good book regarding this uh, uh, dras so you can refer for the uh, for the for other details what we have not covered in this uh, presentation and it also has low quality factor this is uh, uh, that uh, main quality of this thing this uh, dra so low quality factor because the why it is important because it is the important parameter to give you the wider impedance bandwidth because if your quality factor is low you can have uh, we'll see the relation also later <clears throat> then it doesn't have metallic losses metallic losses are totally absent in this kind of radiator because you can see it is a metal or it is a, it is a piece of other material non conducting material so it is because the metallic losses are not there it is very much suitable at high frequencies because the efficiency is getting very down at higher frequencies in metal antennas that right then uh, it also offers compactness because in case of this uh, uh, 3d antennas dielectric dras we are free to choose our material properties uh, epsilon r is normally used around 10 and we are uh, you can use uh, 6 to even 100 but however in case of planar antennas you are limited to use material with uh, around 9 or 10 because then the the structure is not printable the feasibility is not there to print that structure the microstrip lines and then other advantage offered by it that it can be excited using variety of feeding strategies it means uh, different kind of feeding strategies like the planar antennas like insert and all those things uh, plot we will see that so that it also supports those kind of feeding so it can be embedded into the any kind of circuits right so this is system configuration uh, at the bottom you can see this is the uh, these are the people who started working on dra and they 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 led the dielectric resonator to become dielectric resonator antenna so this was the first paper uh, based on the dielectric uh, cavity antenna or dielectric resonator antenna which later known as dielectric resonator antenna yeah so here we see the basic shapes of dra so the commonly known as basic uh, basic shape uh, popular, popular shapes are uh, three shapes are there basically the first one you can see this is the hemisphere then we have a cylindrical shape then the rectangular shape right so i provided some basic equations also to to calculate the resonant frequency so as we can see if we consider them as a radiator so for radiator there are two prop main properties which is the resonant frequency and the impedance bandwidth and these two properties are based on the two things basically the first one is the material uh, characteristics which is material permittivity in our case and second is the dimensions of the structure so as we can see in case of hemisphere we have only one dimension right the only radius will be there and in case of uh, cylinder we have two dimensions radius and the height of the cylinder similarly in case of rectangle we have three dimensions length width and the height of the uh, piece or uh, the material right sample so these properties based on these two things so the hemisphere uh, has very much limitations to give you it does it doesn't give you any design a designer any um, freedom right uh, 
so because it has no if you have fixed the resonant frequency and material characteristics you can get only one solution which is radius right only one radius will be you will be getting however in case of cylindrical uh, it it gives you to a uh, one de uh, degree of freedom to design because if you have uh, fixed the resonant frequency and let's say if you have fixed the uh, uh, permittivity then you will have the dependency on the aspect ratio which is called as r radius to height ratio right so if your radius to height height ratio is maintained your frequency will be same your fundamental frequency will be same so if if it is suppose you are getting radius to height ratio as 2 so you are free to choose radius as 4 height as 2 radius as 8 height as 4 you are free to choose as per your requirement right so this gives you one deg uh, degree of freedom uh, to the designer however in case of rectangular uh, the rectangular piece rectangular shape if you are choosing here we will get, get the two aspect ratios and hence the two degree of freedom to uh, to the designer right so these are the basic shapes uh, also we should know that why only these three are known as the basic shape because these uh, three shapes are basically totally uh, analyzed for various modes are analyzed for these three basic shapes only uh, however there are many shapes which are available and which can be you know that uh, fabricated uh, so for example i have uh, included a slide ah, okay if we talk about modes of dra yeah so we can see that uh, type of mode uh, associated with various kind of structures are pe and tm like transverse electric and transverse magnetic these modes are supported by hemisphere however in case of cylinder there are te tm and hybrid modes hem is known as basically hybrid modes so it also supports hybrid modes uh, in case of rectangular again te and tm modes however there are uh, some limitations by which the tm modes has not been seen till the uh, uh, you know that some by any researcher so mostly t modes are present in that so that will be there right yeah so so here we have seen you can see here uh, uh very you know that some very different shape is available there uh, so this is professor leung very known uh, personality in this uh, dra work basically so Uh, he is from the university of hong kong and he is shown that uh, glass van antenna in 2012 basically and it was working also uh, on the internet it, uh, a video is also uh, available there in that it is uh, acting as a transmitting antenna and he has displayed the characteristic of uh, this antenna so yes uh, those 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 the basic shapes are these only it could be manufactured in any kind of shape so here this antenna is uh, you know serving two purpose it is a decorative item also and it can uh, that serve as an antenna also yeah so okay let's discuss some limitations also so what are the limitations uh, uh, you know that are attributed with this uh, dra for one thing as we know it is a 3d antenna and uh, made of uh, mostly ceramic materials or some composite material so fabrication difficulties will be there uh, the fabrication is not going to be that much easy like the planar antenna because in planar antenna you have to just make a mask or some kind of you know that milling machine you have to give that drawing it will print it on this thing here you have to uh, go uh, some kind of machining also right some kind of drills also you have to use so that thing is there and the second is a relatively large construction cost because uh, the we know that the dielectric materials are not uh, uh, you know that cheap so and we have to use low lossy material so they are a little bit uh, you know cheap uh, that uh, costlier than the other materials and also low quality factor so where it is a you know advantage for the antenna to get a wider bandwidth it is also a limitation because uh, suppose in some kind of application you need um, you know that higher selectivity so there it is a limitation because it's going to cover a wide band of uh, frequencies so at that the nearby radiation will be uh, accepted by the antenna or the transmitter right so the energy will be distributed over the wide range of frequency then it has high form factor because the 3d antenna so that will be there so it is not suitable that very much suitable for the conformal kind of applications um and then the yeah one very good uh, that uh, one very important limitation that rf switch cannot be directly attached to it because it is it does not allow the flow of electric current so directly we cannot use so we have to uh, if you want to make it reconfigurable we have to you know that make provisions uh, in kind of uh, feeding network so that uh, a designer has it has to be very tricky at that time so designer has to be very wisely chosen the structure or the feeding for that that kind of application yeah so let's discuss why dra like why what is the why why not metallic antennas why not uh, you know patch antennas other antennas 
so for that we need to look upon the you know that uh, evolution of our communication system so we started in 1980s with 1g communication right at 2.4 kbps speed uh, having only calls receiving and uh, that uh, exchange of the exchange of uh, calls only right then uh, around 1990s it came with the 2g then speed has increased to 64 kbps then in that case we can uh, you know that uh, uh, communicate uh, on the voice call and as well as the some simple messages text messages then in 3g uh, the speed has further increased and mobile has got broadband we have used some kind of you know uh, a video message also some mms service has been started at that time and then 4g came around 2000 2005 right uh, 10 uh, so the speed has been increased hugely so it, this is you know that 100000 kbps and it was very fast and right now also we are using 4g and we are going to you know that deploy 5g in various parts of the even some uh, you know that some uh, service providers has trial made some uh, trials also like uh, geo and uh, airtel they have made some trials for 5g also so soon we are going to use 5g services also so in 5g the speed is the promised speed is one uh, speed is 1 gbps uh, very huge right so in 4g also we can see we can talk about we can have very you know uh, long video messages we can send we can talk on the move also like the vehicle is there right so that connection was stable during the mobility so those facilities were there and if we see how this uh, the, the data rate has been increased and all those things the services so for that <clears throat> we need to look upon the uh, carrier frequency of various applications right so we need to look upon the carrier frequency of the various applications so if we see the carrier frequency for 1g it all started on 150 megahertz or 900 megahertz then we went to 1.8 gigahertz then in for 3g it was around 2 gigahertz then 2 to 8 gigahertz for 4g right and now in 5g we are going to use sub 6 gigahertz band and even millimeter wave is also planned the 5g services are planned in millimeter wave also right so we have seen that okay yeah there is a you know continuous increment in the carrier frequency of the technologies of the communication system right so that we have seen with from starting from 1g to 5g the carrier frequency is continuously increasing so why it is increasing because if you see so the first thing is congestion in the lower spectrum is potential reason right because the already services are there so we don't want to you know uh, disturb those services so better to move a little bit higher in the, uh, that uh, frequency than the wideband systems are required so basically you know that if we see we are very much limited in the if we talk about the fractional bandwidth so if you are considering that 10 percent bandwidth at 2 gigahertz and 10 percent bandwidth at 4 gigahertz so definitely the 10 percent bandwidth is higher that uh, right 400 megahertz is that can accommodate more number of channels or more wide channels so and the frequency is increased so increased data rate because your number of cycles are there so you can cover more number of cycles you can uh, more kilo bps right the more bits you can send per second so these are the reason you can uh, you have to move towards the higher side of the spectrum with the new technologies right then uh, limiting factors are also there it doesn't mean that we can always you know go beyond that uh, that, that uh, further you know on the uh, uh, higher side of the frequency because atmospheric absorptions are there path losses are there you know that path losses are proportional to the frequency so that has to be increased so those things are there then other factor is the conductor loss this is the main factor right so conductor loss is a crucial factor at higher frequencies how it is limiting the our performance antenna performance because if you see for a microstrip design the conductor losses are proportional to the surface resistance or you can see it is proportional to the square root of the frequency so if you are increasing frequency from uh, 1 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz the losses are going to be doubled right it's square root of the so this thing this is the main thing that conductor losses in the radiator so this affects your radiator efficiency also so yeah so for comparing or to have a clear idea of that thing i uh, i i, I uh, out of one of my work i compared because this i uh, see here this this antenna is basically a hybrid kind of antenna so here you can see some di uh, dielectric dra block is placed over a aperture a slot kind of feeding is used here and one more micro strip resonator it's yet we have two radiators one is this dra and another is the micro strip resonator right so both are placed on the you know nearby frequency so that we can some nearby dual kind of or maybe by combining them we can have a wideband operation little bit so here uh, if we see the simulation result so you can see here the orange line is showing the dra resonance right and uh, here we are the y-axis shows the power losses right in the radiator 
and here if you see the about the micro strip resonator msr so the losses are if you see the 10 milliwatt the losses are 10 milliwatt here if you see the watt power here and here it is 25 milliwatt right so it is more than you know around 2.5 times so losses in micro strip resonator 2.5 times than dra so this is what how we can realize that okay how lossy it could be at uh, this is around 7 gigahertz so similarly this 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 thing has been established that okay the metallic antenna has to be very lossy in comparison of dielectric resonator antenna so your efficiency is going to be high in case of dra yeah so one thing is one thing is that the dra provides you low losses right then wideband and high gain it also provides us uh, you know that characteristic wideband characteristic and high gain how because it supports multi-mode operation, if designed carefully, it supports multi-mode operation. Here, I, I, I have shown you that one rectangular DRA. So some higher modes are also shown here. So this is the fundamental mode, TE del 11, TE del 13, and del 15. So here the variation of the electric field, right? That is shown in the uh, this vertical axis. So that thing shows you the uh, that uh, uh, subscript of this uh, norm nomenclature, mode nomenclature. So if you are able to design the design the choose choose the you know that uh, uh, dimension and the permittivity of the material carefully so that you can have these uh, you multi modes in the vicinity so finally you can combine them and you can have a either multi mode or wideband operation and at higher modes it at, by default because this is going to vary at a higher frequency so at higher modes it's going to be give you a, a high gain right so these things are inherently associated with dielectric resonator antenna so it offers us high efficiency because uh, no losses are there high gain right then wide bandwidth and stable radiation characteristics so these uh, things are make it a very good uh, candidate for the practical uses so here i've shown you different feeding schemes like uh, you have seen the practice that uh, planar antennas have uh, have been excited by different uh, things so similarly it can also be excited by using different kind of techniques so a micro strip feed has been used a pro feed has been used right then a slot feed has been used for the to excite the dra and then a conformal strip also used, right? A conformal strip is there, and a differential excitation also has been given. And the, in case of prop feed, you can either put it on the, you know, that edge of the boundary of the uh, DRA or at, inside the uh, DRA, right? So um, CPW feed also has been exposed. So similarly, I've not included, uh, you know, that uh, other feeds also. So mostly every feed has been tried for this thing. Uh, for DRA, this supports all kinds of feeds there. So this is also a good thing about DRAs, right? <clears throat> so come to wideband DRAs, right? So as we have seen that the requirement of wideband, uh, you know, the communication systems, as we are moving uh, uh, higher on the technology side, so we have to move, uh, we need more wideband, right? More wideband characteristics of the antenna also to get the higher data rate and all those things. So there are different techniques has been used to become to you know that uh, to increase the bandwidth of the dielectric resonator antenna. So here I've listed some like a low quality factor. If you are going to lower the quality factor of DRA, your bandwidth is going to be high. Uh, then hybrid DRAs also have been explored, right? You know, this very popular technique, like to make it hybrid, to either make uh, either use a, a different kind of radiator or you can use uh, your resonance of the feeder circuit also to improve the. Uh, bandwidth then stacking of multiple dras uh, then differently shaped dras the modified geometries of dra and then fractal dras also has been have been explored uh, for the wideband operation so we will see them right so yeah how it works as actually so the quality factor we know that quality factor is proportional to inversely proportional to the fractional bandwidth right so that is how and the quality factors also you know the, it, it, it is the ratio of energy stored inside the dra and the energy dissipated from the surface area so energy stored basically in the volume and uh, energy dissipated from the outer surface of the so if we are going to uh, increase the surface area and reduce the volume of the dra we can get a lower value of q and because the q is lower so the fractional bandwidth can be increased right so in the very first work like uh, uh, that was a 2006 right yeah so the the scientist the, the researcher has explored the perforation technique like here you can see the drills has been the drills have been made uh, at the outer outer side of the in the annular ring fashion right so it is basically going to you know uh, give you the higher bandwidth you can see it is a profit design as a connector and probe is uh, right here uh, to the dr to the dra and you can see here this is the dra dotted line and this one 
and this is you know the wide band operation it is because of the perforated dri so yes out of this because of this perforation your bandwidth has been increased significantly right <clears throat> so in the other work and another work uh, our researcher they have a more you know that included uh, epsilon effective also in this expression basically so you can see so the quality factor depends on the volume surface ratio and the epsilon effective right and by basically perforating this yani we, we are basically removing this uh, dielectric material from this kind of this this place right this area we are removing so basically we are lowering the epsilon r of that particular volume because the here the here the volume has the material uh, relative permittivity epsilon r in this portion it is the one right the uh, permittivity of the air so total overall the overall if you see the effective permittivity is going to be reduced uh, finally you are going to a lower value of quality factor so they reported uh, they reported 56% impedance bandwidth uh, which is huge right so typically it gives you a rectangular design or some other designs they gives you around 10% uh, values uh, of bandwidth so they shown and they have also shown the stable radiation pattern right so here you can see this is at the first resonance at 2.8 gigahertz and this is at the second resonance at 3.9 gigahertz so radiation pattern is also maintained broadside and a stable character we can see throughout the operation <clears throat> yeah so in another work uh, they have used uh, material uh, here you can see this is the complete picture of the antenna right so here they have also used the uh, make uh, use of siw like surface integrated wave to you know the remove the uh, surface waves and uh, so here you can see they have iterated basically four times here so this is the basic antenna they considered uh, this is simple 0.5 lambda g right a simple block of rectangular block of this material then they perforated in this kind of thing so this is a kind of lattice structure they have uh, used here so you see and then they use the make use of siw also to make some enhancement in the gain right so here you can see here this is the uh, the s11 or the reflection coefficient of the structure so this is the black line a sharp resonance you can see this is the for the antenna one and then as soon as we are going to the antenna antenna 2 or antenna b you can see the red one the you are getting a wider band right so basically right so you are getting a wider band here and you can see here Similarly, as the band, band, band gets wider here at the lower frequency, your gain is also improved. So this also shows, okay, by the using the perforations, we can have the wider bandwidth with a good uh, radiation characteristics. So the measurements also shows, okay, this is the gain plot or the frequency. You can see the gain is also consistent around 8, 8 dB. And the S11, VSWR for less than 2, it gives you a wide bandwidth approximate of 9, 39%, right? And peak gain of... 9.6 that 9.6 here so this is a significant improvement in the bandwidth <clears throat> yeah and if we talk about the second part that is the hybrid dra so here i have uh, shown you one work one very interesting work the recently presented like right, uh, just one year back in november 2020 it is published so here people have used uh, the uh, liquid dielectric resonator antenna and uh, you know ME dipole that is a magnetoelectric dipole it's shown so here you can see a magnetic magnetoelectric dipole is shown here so this is a, you know very popular in case of base station antennas because it gives you a very uh, stable radiation pattern and a higher gain right so this kind of uh, dipole he has used uh, the researchers have used and uh, this is fed by a slot here you can see a cup aperture here slot here and the bottom you have you, you we have a micro strip line right so with this he has excited this the um, that uh, researchers and then later on they put uh, some kind of some you know cylindrical dra here and the outer jacket also has made to to to, to enclose the uh, liquid right liquid dra so this is a picture of complete antenna we see the results so here are the results summarized of this uh, work so you can see uh, this is the, the 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 lighter one you can see this is the me dipole only when only the basic dipole is there so you are getting only this much bandwidth, right? And this is a DRA only. A DRA has a lower resonance, right? Because of its size and other property. So, and when we are merging both, so we are getting a very wide. You can see a complete 10 dB operation from this frequency around 2.5 to uh, 5.2, right? So we are getting complete wide band, single band operation. And uh, here they have shown the modes also, right? They have identified with their work. 
So this is basically the electric dipole resonance there, then magnetic dipole resonance. This is the speeding aperture, the slot resonance, and this is the DRA resonance. And you see the for different frequency, different resonances pattern. The pattern is very much stable in the broad side, right? Broad side is maintained. If you see the radiation is maximum to maximized towards the bore side, right? So this kind this work is very you know good to over the band, that complete bandwidth. The bandwidth achieved is from 25.5% to 73.5. A huge, you know, that improvement in the bandwidth we achieved and with very stable pattern. And if you see here, they also have worked, uh, they also tried, you know, that uh, explore the properties of this antenna from for a various uh, uh, a very range of uh, temperatures, right? So that it could be suitable for some odd locations also. So they have uh, explored that what is the effect on the antenna if we are because it is using a liquid here inside so it is uh, they vary the temperature from minus 20 degree to plus 60 degree inside the chamber during the measurement and they have seen the variation the this this the, this scale is showing the variation of the but uh, we can see like uh, overall the over throughout this range it is not you know crossing the 10 db limit right it is very much stable and here they have basically with the temperature they explore the properties of the liquid what they have used here right so this is the loss tangent this is the permittivity of the material that liquid they have used so it is quite stable except that plus 60 they have seen some changes little bit at plus 60 right so yeah the work is good and uh, they show on a very wide bandwidth using different kind of resonances by merging together <clears throat> so okay one more work i've summarized here for so because of that you know that uh, differential uh, feeding the inherent advantages of differential feeding is it can get a better uh, you know noise figure of better better can noise cancellation right and the rejection of common mode noise will be there all those things so we explored one differential fed dra so yeah this is the work uh, which we have performed right so the work was published in apmc 2016 so here we proposed a you know novel technique to excite a dra uh, through a differential signal. So here, basically, we have used very simple thing. We have used two open-ended lines and some gap is there, G gap is there, right? And if we see, uh, so we have to just simply put this block, DRA block over the, uh, this gap, right? Over the microstrip line. <clears throat> so if we see carefully that how it is exciting the DRA. So if we see the more, the fields, electric fields inside the DRA, so this is showing the electric fields inside the DRA. This is the top view. So the red lines are showing the electric fields and the blue lines are showing the magnetic field lines. So in the, from the top view, right? From the top view, we see the fields excited uh, between this uh, uh, gap, uh, differential gap, right? So which is excited by a differential signal. So the electric field lines are similarly and similar and the similarly the magnetic field will be in this direction, right? So we can see, we can easily conclude, right? So because both the fields are very much similar, so we have very good chances, okay, the fields can be coupled to the DRA. And that's how the DRA has been excited. So, but, uh, so, you know, that, uh, uh, because to arrange that hybrid, that, uh, you know, differential signal is, or differential measurements are at other, at other, you know, that other task or typical task. So what we have done, we have simply used a retrace coupler to provide that 180 degree phase shift of the, on the two sides of the arms. So that we have included here and that's how we have checked here. So this work, the material used was 10.2, right? So this thing uh, we tested. So for a further simulation, if we see, so here is the shown the, you know, reflection coefficient. So we are getting a very narrow band excitation for in the fundamental mode. And this is the gain plot also showing you that, okay, the, the excitement is only for that, that particular frequency. So these are the fields shown in near field simulation and the software, right? So this is the electric field. And this is the uh, that uh, magnetic field, right? This is the inside the screen, if you see. So the DRA volume, these dimensions was uh, chosen. And uh, the if you see the uh, the method actually, which we used to approximate the or uh, to analyze the resonant frequency of this structure is a dielectric waveguide model, DWM, right? So that, that has been adopted. So we calculated the resonant frequency around 2.6 gigahertz. And in the simulation also we see that the resonance is coming around at 2.6 only, right? So we further optimize this structure. 
and uh, they are the level of the uh, we see the gap we have varied basically we had three three, three parameters here to optimize one is the gap between the two lines another is the offset in the x dimension and then the y direction right so these two offset and this gap has been optimized so we conclude that okay the gap is around 0.25 lambda uh, for this substrate and arrangement uh, that has to be used to get the maximum reflection coefficient for the maximum matching basically right and so the dr and the this has to be offset has to be zero so basically centrally it has to be placed so the proposed arrangement the limit it is limited uh, to a narrow band excitation so then we proposed these stuffs there at the uh, you know that at the termination of these uh, lines so these stuffs were placed here right so with a length ls and with some ws right so with this help of these stuffs we have got you know you can see here a very wide uh, you know that uh, operation wide band operation here uh, just with the help of these stuffs so that has been fabricated and then measured here right so <clears throat> so also right then uh, how it works actually that what you may ask or we, we can get to know that why how they are basically you know working how we are getting this wide band operation because of this lambda resonator stuff so yeah let me tell you that these stuffs are uh, acting as a, as a lambda resonators so that is why we are getting another resonance right in the our desired frequency range right so if you see this complete arrangement can be seen as a superposition of this arrangement which we already have discussed the so electric field will be similar to this these will be electric field right for a differential signal and similarly for this structure if we see consider the as a lambda resonator so the electric fields will be like this so again the electric field will be maximum at the center how because if you see this is a near field simulation and if we refer uh, the you know uh, balani book also it is shown here the if it is a distance is zero the current has to be minimum here right the current has to be minimum here at the end because it is open end so field has to be maximum so similarly at the at the center also because it is lambda by 2 at the, uh, that current will be zero so that has to be field will be maximum here so electric field so ultimately what is happening we are getting the same kind of field arrangement field excitation at the center this is very much supportive to each other and the resonance we are getting at the in the our desired range of frequencies right so finally it has uh, further analyzed that uh, that uh, because uh, one question was that if it is the uh, you know that you know that uh, the if it is a lambda resonator it cannot have you know that uh, 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 broadside pattern right for the lambda resonator we will not we will not be having that broadside pattern so but we ultimately we were getting broadside pattern so what was the reason so we have find out that the the resonance was non derivative basically so in the analysis we have find out the complete magnetic field will be broken in different parts like tangential and normal so we have seen the tangential component will be you know so this is the current flowing inside this conductor so the magnetic field will be in the loop around this conductor right so we will have a tangential component for the surface and we will have a normal component which is going inside the uh, substrate so those it can be broken the complete tangential normal field can be broken into the four components like we have we have identified this l1 r1 l2 and r2 and also from this current flow we can see the what will going to happen that hx l1 it means hx this is the x this is the y right so hx and H, hz basically y component will not be there because loops will be like this only so hx l1 will be opposite to the uh you know hx r1 hx l1 will be opposite to the hx r1 because current is flowing in the opposite side right so the ultimately what is going to happen net output net uh, you know, the radiative that uh, uh, magnetic field is going to be zero which is doing as a non radiative resonance because of this arrangement here and this work has been published in the ieee antenna wireless propagation propagation letter right so <clears throat> so finally that's uh, the same structure we have uh, arranged in this fashion right so we basically cut down the structure from here because it was taking a large uh, footprint right so we have uh, arranged this kind of cylinder here transition has been made here so that we can excite the this 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 uh, differential signal we can give to the upper side of the main feeder of the dra and then we have seen some other uh, parametric study has been done so we can see that the ls for with the length of the resonator this second resonance is getting varied the first resonance is corresponding to the basically dra right dielectric resonator antenna so the size also has been if we compare with the earlier one like when the complete thing on the single layer 
with this thing we have reduced the biotis by 63 percent the only now the footprint ratio, this is only 37 percent right <clears throat> So further the and the this 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 has shown the, here we are showing the you know the simulation results of the fundamental the reference antenna so we can see a very you know very narrow bandwidth was obtained here then we have got the two resonances here then uh, in the simulation then blue line is showing the measurement results so we can see the point the results have been quite matching the gain is also measured so very much similar we have seen the measured the pattern also. So they are very much good and uh, you know they're very much ma matching with the simulation results. So we have seen that 30 percent dependence bandwidth was achieved, and that was the uh, that is the highest in case of differential feed DRS. Yeah. So if we see another method of uh, to get the wide band is differently shaped DRS. You know, shaping of DRS can also help you to get the wide band response. So here I have some of that uh, you know summarized two uh, works just to have the idea. It is very much popular. Right. So in this work, uh, a T-shaped DRA was uh, analyzed and uh, total 75% impedance bandwidth was achieved. Here we can see, right, with the help of a conformal strip excitation, they achieved uh, this 75% impedance bandwidth. And in the recent work, uh, this is a just 2021 paper, published, published paper. Here they have used as uh, for wideband also and this shape to produce the circular polarization also. Right. So this is a slot fed uh, structure. And this shape allows you to uh, get the circular uh, polarization inside the TRA. And they further made, they, they firstly, they made a single element, circularly polarized, then they made a sequentially feed arrangement of these uh, DRAs to get a wider axial ratio bandwidth, right? So here, finally, they achieved 43% impedance bandwidth with a circular polarization, right, for the axial ratio bandwidth of 38.5%, which is really very good bandwidth, right? So yes, they have achieved very good axial ratio. So we can see that, okay, these are very good DRS also suitable for circular polarization, right? And uh, with a great bandwidth. Yeah, so just to have an idea, I've uh, included some work here. Uh, so what happened in this case uh, that how to get this, because uh, you can see how to shape the antenna, right? Because uh, there is it not, is it not a random thing. So what we can do, we can do the mode profiling basically, you know, that. Uh, so we can uh, merge uh, different modes uh, to get the uh, wide bandwidth, right? So here we have uh, taken a simple radiator block, right? A simple D rectangular block here with these dimensions, and we calculated using the same dielectric waveguide model. Uh, so the earlier four more modes were uh, calculated at this frequency: 5.9 gigahertz, 7.5, 8.7, and 10.3 gigahertz. We estimated, right? Then we seen. <coughs> And the simulation, so yes, we are getting the fundamental first mode and the last mode basically, right? Inside, in between also, we can see there is a little thing, but the, it is not properly matched, so we are not getting those excited properly. Uh, the matching is required basically, right? Then we confirmed these modes uh, with the near field simulation. Here you can see, so for T111 mode, right, for to the Y, Y. So here we can see the half cycle, uh, one half cycle here, and similarly one here. In this case, we are having one in the X, and two inside the in the y direction, two cycles, right? You can see here, right? Two cycles are there. In case of the other mode at 8.7 gigahertz, so we have seen that two cycles are here and another one, one cycle in the y direction. However, in case of highest mode, we can see two cycles we are getting here. Here also we are getting from this side to this side and this side to this side. So presence of these modes were you know confirmed using near field simulation in the software tool. And then the challenge was to excite them properly so that we can get a single wideband operation, right? So for that, we need to, you know, observe carefully the impedance, input impedance. So here you can see we inserted one notch there, then the two notches there. So effect of that thing, you can see here, the black line shows you without the non notch. So black line, in case of black line, you can see the variation of the real part, and this is the imaginary part. So real part is going around, you know, around three, here, beyond 300 million, uh, ohms, and the imaginary part which has to be ideally zero, it should be the input dependence should be 50 plus J0, right? So we have minimized that those variations by, uh, you know, inserting two notches there, making two notches there. So you can see the blue part. The blue part means the, you know, variation has been limited to only 150 or 170 something. It is also reduced here in this case, imaginary part. <clears throat> then further, we optimize this dimension here. So you can see here the, the blue one, right? So here you can see this is limited here in this case, and it is coming closer to 
yeah, zero part that is reactance part has come closer to the zero ohms, right? So that has been seen uh, seen here. And if you see for the D one the notch depth is seven mm, seven mm, you can see a complete wideband operation for the blue line. Complete wideband operation possible here, right? For the given arrangement. And here we have uh, that compiled that the bandwidth. So you can see here. So the bandwidth is <coughs> around. Uh, yeah, 27% at 7 mm, right? The notch band. Now that's how we can fix up that, okay, the notch band should be 7 mm because we are getting it uh, uh, the highest value here. And if you further increase the notch depth, so the value of this, uh, the bandwidth is going to be decreased. Then we further optimize various parameters like offset parameter, the feed can be offset, right? So that you can see here, the blue, the black one, what we have started, and then the blue one, right? So the in for the blue graph, you can see it is very much close to the 50, right? So for a VSWR of 2, the acceptable value is 25 to 100, correct? No? For a VSWR of 2, we can, uh, you know, we, we need this uh, real part between 25 and 100, right? And it has to be close to 0. So if we, with uh, this offset, you can see it is very much in the limits. So yes, so for when Finally, we introduce some kind of asymmetricity there and we have obtained that, okay, this asymmetricity is giving us some benefit over on the bandwidth. So this is a final bandwidth achieved here. You can see here a single complete operation from this frequency to this frequency, right? A single band operation from, for the uh, other notch as, as 3 mm. And here you can see the reference DRA, what we have started and uh, carefully and systematically we, you know, that uh, uh, treatment of the impedance, we can achieve this kind of bandwidth here. But you need to, every time you have to see the, through the near field simulation, the mode should not get affected, right? And then finally, what we have, we fabricated one with a little, you know, you can see here, the, the angle was provided here. This angle is uh, 45 degree here and how it is provided. Because if you see the field success, because, because of this offset field, your fields, because this is the, you know, the low permittivity area, the fields are going in the diagonally. And this is basically causing us a slant polarization here, finally. So for that to convert it into the linear polarization, we have rotated the, we have provided a relative rotation between the feed and the radiator. So you can see here, we achieved the linear polarization with the help of this thing, right? So these are the measured results of asymmetric E-shaped DRA and published in IET, micro antenna and propagation letters. So the measured and uh, uh, simulated results are matching well. <coughs> These are the patterns we can see. Yeah, it's completely broadside. Broadside is maintained, right? Broadside pattern is maintained. So yeah. So if you see the other uh, thing like the stacking of multiple DRAs, so uh, okay. So stacking also has been used to get the higher order modes excited and merging it to the your operation, right? So this is the that uh, one example of this having it and so you can see right the gain is also high gain was obtained around 10 to 11 dB right so that has been there then again the one DRA uh, in this shape uh, for circular polarization has been used and a wide impedance bandwidth of 54 percent was uh, taken right so quite uh, you know that uh, stacking also provide you uh, to improve the uh, bandwidth then some fractal DR is also, you know, that explored to get the wide band. I've simply, you know, that uh, citing their results. So 64% of impedance bandwidth is achieved with 4.9 dBIP gain in this case. And then recently some, 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 uh, the a circular polarization achieved, right? And uh, with this fractal, they have achieved the circular polarization also and some wide band uh, uh, operation bandwidth also. So 37% impedance bandwidth and actual ratio bandwidth was 11.6%. <clears throat> so all these things shows us, okay, they, they are very good. They can be, the wide band operations are very much possible using different techniques. Now, now go to the other part of the presentation, which is basically uh, different applications where DRAs are used, right? So you can see uh, this in paper, like right? So here, uh, this is a paper of 2020 only. So base station application was targeted in this. And here we can see the author has compared two antennas. One is the patch antennas for dual polarization. Another is a DRA. So that beauty of DRA in the beauty, then the DRA you can use a single radiator, right? Only feed has to be dual, dual polarized, to be polarized, right? In this case, also they have used similar kind of feeding arrangement, right? <clears throat> and for the gain enhancement, they are used uh, multiple, you know, stacked layer of patch, 
so they compared these two structures and as a prototype they made a single uh, singly polarized uh, uh, dra and uh, they compared in their uh, you know uh, in their conclusion that this work compares two possible uh, for that uh, concept using uh, dra and metallic antenna the result shows that dra concept is very promising compared to stack patch antenna the number of pcb layers is reduced in case of dra number of pcb layers are reduced because it gives you sufficient gain right so as a proof they have also tested something and the bandwidth was improved by almost 50 percent right the operational bandwidth was improved in this case by almost 50 percent than this metallic patch antenna so yes it is promising for the so similar yeah it's promising for this application in the other work a steerable very good work steerable dra for 5g it was targeting right so it was basically for iot kind of application device to device communication is promised for 5g applications so that has to be that was targeted in this and what has done so they have basically you know some parasitic elements have they have used some parasitic elements was connected to the ground using some capacitors so the capacitor was biased here right so with the proper biasing you can see here this is the you know the uh, mm, uh, reflection coefficient of the structure in various cases so they have seen the various cases like so cases was basically for what they provided you uh, beam steering without any phase shifter. Uh, if you are aware about the arrays, you know that uh, uh, you know, in, with the help of progressive phase shift, we need some progressive phase shift between the elements. So we need some kind of phase shifter to steer the beam, right? Some progressive phase shift has to be supplied there between the elements. However, here in this case, they have not used any kind of phase shifter. With these parasitic elements only, they have steered the beam here you can see the beam is at the bore side and the plus this plus minus 18 degree plus 18 degree minus 32 degree plus 32 degree so from 32 minus 32 degree to plus 32 degree they have they uh, observe the steerability of this element right so how it is happening because if you are controlling them thing uh, these things with the parasitic element so one time the main element is getting excited and the other so is this in this case the the you know the beam will be tilting to the this side the wave front is tilted to this side right at the minus 32 degree when both are grounded there will not be any tilting and the beam will be in the bore side and if you want to tilt it to the plus 32 side uh, right side then you have to excite this thing active this element and you can get the beam steered in this direction so and the summary the design attained plus minus 32 degree steering abilities by switching the termination capacitor at parasitic dr exciting the fundamental mode so yeah one more thing here has to be you know notice that in this case you can see there the uh, there is a higher mode excited which is del 1 1 you know, that 1 del uh, 1 del 3 right and in this case the lower the uh, parasitic they have used only the fundamental mode and that is depending on the dimensions of this DRA, right? So the higher order mode is giving you a higher gain here. So without the need of a phase shifter, this is a very good thing, right? So you can just completely eliminating one element, which is right. So which is lossy also, right? Phase shifters are lossy. So it can be considered the proposed DRA can be potentially applied for device to device communication in 5G Internet of Things application. <clears throat> So yeah, this is the last application. So which I've included here. So RF energy harvesting, right? So recently uh, uh, we submitted a paper here showing the potential of these things. Why? Because you know that uh, for the RF energy harvesting means we are using the antenna as the receiving element. So it has to be high gain. It has to be high gain. It has to be broadband. It has to be uh, high radiation efficiency, right? All these things makes DR is suitable for this kind of application because you have to work on the very low power, right? So in the very low power is available in the environment. So that has to be captured. So a DRA was, you know, that uh, fabricated with a kind of reflector arrangement uh, because some it is providing some kind of gain. You, here you can see the gain of the uh, antenna has been increased if you are using some this reflector. And this is a simulated and measured uh, reflection coefficient of the antenna, a very wide operation it is uh, giving us. And then what happens that uh, too, because uh, uh, I was not available in the, during the complete, uh, you know, that last talk, uh, but uh, I believe that there is a lot of limitations on the wideband rectified circuits, right? So what we have done here, we made four different rectified circuits. One is at 1.8 gigahertz, 2.1 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 3.6 gigahertz, considering various applications, right? So a 1.8, 2.1, and 2.4, we are available signal in the free space. So we can 
check the performance of this so this is the uh, that uh, reflection coefficient of the <clears throat> with the input power right input power signal of the rectifier and then here we have uh, checked the voltage dc voltage out to output of the rectifier circuit and the efficiency right so with the input uh, input power right so these are the non linear simulations basically because the non linear element is the attached there the diode so that's why we need to confirm these uh, this uh, as with the the as one one also we need to see with the varying power levels right then this is the v output so finally the it was measured here so we can see so we are getting from the rectina circuit right so this is the from the rectina circuit at 1.8 gigahertz we are uh, in the free from the free space it is taking the signal and giving you this voltage output right with the input power level varying input power level and this is the input power and efficiency of the rectifier circuit so those has been compared here and the point was that to put, to show the potential of dras for the energy harvesting applications right so in the uh, recent communication uh, that uh, 2020 we compared this DRA with a metallic antenna. Similar outer dimensions were kept same. So just to maintain the aperture of the antenna, right? So we can see here the DRA resonance is much wider than the microstrip uh, antenna, right? Uh, resonance. Also the same that uh, gain is uh, it is around 5.2 dBi, right? In this case it is only 3.8 dBi gain is there. So at a distance of 450, yeah, this is the matching network and all those simulation setup. So this is a simulation result. So we have seen at a distance of 450 mm, right, between the two sources uh, from the source to the rectina circuit, we can get this much. So around 1.5 volt we can have as the output, right, from the DRA antenna. And if you are using the metal antenna, it will be around one volt, right. So it is a huge, you know, that uh, voltage difference in the output. So yeah, some outdoor testing was also performed here. So on site, we went on site, right. We have seen that uh, this is the outdoor testing this is with the dra arrangement the antenna uh, these are different uh, right so these were these were the uh, antenna so around 193 millivolt we have uh, obtained in the multimeter you can see here this is 193 millivolt output and for the same side same location same thing the output is only 125 millivolt with the uh, using uh, the uh, a microscope or patch antenna right <clears throat> so the paper rect it, it compares basically dra and msp a uh, microscope patch antenna so it is investigated and established that the rectina exhibits better results while using DRA as a receiving element. So that was there, right? So now I'm concluding my talk. So we have seen basic shapes. We discuss about the background introduction, like with various qualities, various properties and limitations also, right? We have seen the relevance of the uh, DRAs because uh, day by day the free operating frequency is increasing for various applications. So relevance also we have discussed. Then wideband techniques we have seen. We have seen some special DRAs like liquid and some differential fed and all those you know, shaped DRAs. Also, we have established the suitability of DRA for various applications. So with this, uh, uh, I will conclude my talk. Uh, thank you. And if you have any queries, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Datta. Uh, it's a very interesting and informative talk. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I would like to uh, call Dr. Indranil. Please take the questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Actually, there are some few questions from the participants. So. Yeah. So one. Actually, participant has asked, sir, what is the main application of DRA? Oh, main application. <laughs> see, we have covered so many applications. So, see, yes. whatever, <laughs> where, wherever you want to use antenna. So, we are, you know, the targeting the, uh, we are talking about the replacement of microstep antennas with the DRA. And, you know, the antennas are always, uh, you know, it is a very mandatory element in any kind of communication system. Uh, so it has to be, you know, everywhere, everywhere in any kind of in 5G also, if you see any kind of your, your, uh, I mean, your, your mobile, uh, mobile is having many antennas, your laptop is having many antennas. And right now we are going, you know, that wearable antennas also. And uh, so many kind of like here we have covered three applications, right? So RF energy harvesting is there, then base station application, then 5G IoT application. So we are moving towards the IoT. So where every device has to, you know, some kind of antenna to communicate with the other devices. 
so antenna is required everywhere so wherever the antenna is required we can use uh, dra as the substitute right uh, uh, to the other kind of antennas so it has many applications it is up to you in which application you want to use so the next question from uh, dr arvin kumar is dra reliable at uh, terahertz frequency range ah uh, yes uh, i i can't comment on the reliability but yes i have seen many you know some dot antennas kind of papers there which are uh, at the terahertz frequency range so yes that work is uh, you know that happening in that range also and i believe that because work is published uh, on some good uh, journal so it is reliable enough i believe uh, but i i have no experience on that so is next question is from meka navina is 3d printing can be done for fabrication of dra yes 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 uh, uh, because of the time limitation i could not include uh, you know then some papers because i wanted to include that also because as i told you that manufacturing uh, you know complexities are there so but that can be overcome by the 3d printing so yes people have used 3d printing for the uh, to making the dra and it is available in the papers also okay next question from rashita tripathi sir can we use uh, meta surfaces concept in dra certainly 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 see uh, okay meta surfaces uh, so uh i know that i even i have worked on uh, one kind of you know, some prs not exactly meta surface uh, but uh, some if you are aware about the fabry parrot antenna so there is basically some partially reflecting surfaces are used right so as a primary radiator you can always use prs uh, to excite that meta surface right so yes that is possible and even you know engrooving different kind of uh, periodic pattern also substrate like uh, if you see there are only substrate so that is also some kind of uh, dielectric only there is no metal included in the uh, antenna okay. so next question from komal preet kaur again does bra shaped effect on uh, resonance peak means uh, can we increase the number of resonance peaks with different shapes yeah yeah that's what i told you see 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 uh, if you see here uh, in this work so the shape was only rectangle we can see only the two you know two peaks right then we merge them together right to get a wide band operation so here if you see see here how many peaks are there there are different four peaks are right so you can merge all those nodes together by shaping it okay so little explain about hem mode working principle in dra uh hem mode basically see these are the hybrid electric so how do you know that uh, Mm. Yeah. So HEM modes are basically, you know, the hybrid electric mode, hybrid electric mode, that hybrid modes basically. So how do we nomenclature the TE and TM modes uh, by considering that the electric field component is not present in one particular direction, right? So TE to X, TE to Y, TE to Z, like this we used to say. So that shows the electric field component in that direction is not present. because the electric field is present in kind of some circles right so circle is a 2d geometry right so those will be there so te or tm it means it is completely the the the, the component is completely absent in that particular direction however in case of hybrid electric magnetic mode those both components will coexist and they you know take part in the radiation so that is there but uh, that is also found only the cylindrical kind of geometries not in the rectangle geometries uh for further detail you have to you know that uh, go to the book because uh, uh because we have to see different kind of you know that mode fields are there so if you are able to understand those mode field mode fields inside the dra you can easily estimate the pattern of the uh, shape or pattern of the radiator radiator <clears throat> Okay. So next question from Shiva Sangu Sanmugavali. How did you read the power loss of antenna? Ah, uh, okay. So that is basically you know uh, if you go into the the software used by the CST. So in CST uh, simulation in simulation it because of, see that uh, the reactivity and the gain also from the simulator you can easily uh, you know uh, find out those values. So simply, you can get the losses. Okay. Because the okay, directivity is yeah, gain is the uh, efficiency and the 
direct activity, right? And the losses are included there. So from there, in the simulation software, you can get, get it directly in CSC. Sir, last question from the one of the participants, Rajkumar Jaiswal. He's asking, could we get PPT for uh, our research reference? PPT? Uh, yeah, sure, I will share it, no issue. Uh, but I also believe that you are uh, going to share the recordings also, right? Yes, 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 yeah, sir, sure. Yeah, so you can always take it into the reference. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your informative talk. It was really nice and interesting. And uh, there are so many queries still. We have we are getting queries due to time constraint. We cannot uh, uh, we cannot uh, show all the queries. We, okay. Anyway, you have sir's uh, mail ID. You can uh, mail any time to our uh, speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So thank you, sir, thank for you. coming over here and delivering nice lecture. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, colleague, Dr. Dranil, co-coordinator, Dr. Gautam, and all the participants for joining the session. Yeah, and yeah. I would also request all the participants, please fill the feedback form okay, for both of the days, yesterday, weather, today, and also the assessment form. So please do it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will meet again tomorrow at 2 p.m. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir.